to call the GDC meeting to order. First item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. You can stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is the election of a JBC chair and vice chair. Is there any motions on the floor? Make a motion for Senator Harrington to be the JBC chair. I have a second. second. And we have a motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I would like to make a motion to nominate Don Hammond as vice chair of JBC. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Ms. Harrington? Okay, thank you, Chair Lynch. Third item on our agenda this evening is our presentation of construction managers. Mr. Toddy? I will be the first group right in. Thank you. So our, our first presentation is from DEW Construction, and I, I will introduce the president, Mr. Taylor Woodward, and uh, you can introduce your team. Yep. Can you guys get 30 minutes to talk to the JVC? A few minutes for questions afterwards. What I, is there a glass of water? Uh, I will go over and find you some water. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, um, my name is Taylor Woodward. I'm president of the DEW. Um, thank you all very much for including us in this process in this particular phase of the process. Um, we've been asked to provide a presentation followed up by Q&A. So we're really hoping that we get the opportunity to answer all your questions or any concerns that you have. So if you see any point during the presentation that you'd like to interject, please do. So we can make sure to answer all your questions. Um, I'll get right to it and introduce DW, And then we'll move on to introduce the team. And then we'll move on to speak briefly to our experiences, and then we'll transition right to Q&A is how we've structured our presentation. And can everybody hear us okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Um, so DEW was founded in 1997. Um, we, when we started DEW, it was started as a construction management firm. So historically, over 80% of the work that we've done is all construction management work. As of today, um, 100% of the work that we do is either construction management or design build. We still do a little bit competitive bid work, but primarily it's all construction management work. Um, when we were founded, a major importance to our founder, Don Wells, was making sure that we were providing the best construction management services we possibly could in the marketplace. And in order to do that, we needed to build the best <coughs> estimating team and pre-construction team that we could, because ultimately that's the that's where you get the value out of the construction management process. It's during the pre-construction phase between now and when the project starts. Um, so we really put a major focus on that goal. And since then, I think we've done a really great job at assembling a good team in our estimating and pre-construction department, some of which are here right now. Um, we also have, I think it's important to note, we have in-house mechanical electrical plumbing uh, services. So we have two engineers in-house, cost estimating engineers, that can interact with the design team and make sure that we're making good decisions as it relates to the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, scopes of work. There's been a lot of pricing volatility in the marketplace. It allows us as a, another party in-house to, to uh, vet that stuff out with Banwell and the design team. Um, DEW has about 135 people. We have three offices, which you can see on the screen. We have our Williston, Vermont office, our Key, New Hampshire office, and our Manchester, New Hampshire office. Um, our Northern Vermont office and Manchester are our two largest revenue generating offices. They actually both do pretty similar amounts of revenue per year. Keene's a little smaller just because of the economic activity in that area is a little different. Um, we have 50 tradespeople 
on staff that can self-perform various scopes of work. We really have strategically tried not to compete with our subcontractors so they don't feel like they're bidding against the house, but they're in place to make sure that you know, if there is a, a financial issue that we have to overcome during the pre-construction process and we're not getting favorable pricing from the subs, um, we can leverage our own resources to help facilitate a more cost-effective approach to various scopes of work. And it also helps us <clears throat> maintain schedule too. So if we find a sub is not keeping up with uh, our schedule, we can supplement that effort and make sure that we stay on schedule. How often do you find that to be the case? Oh, oh, oh hang on. Oh, I'm sorry, you said interrupted. You felt you I did. You, no. you, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, Those words. Yeah, um, so uh, bonded work is a huge portion of our book. Um, we Almost all of our work is bonded work. Zurich is our bonding company. Um, we've had them since we started 26 years ago. And at the time, they were the largest bonding company in the United States. I think they're second to travelers now. But we have a really close relationship with Zurich just to the amount of work that we do with them. Um, we can bond up to a $100 million single project. We can bond up to $250 million aggregate volume at a time. <laughs> And um, safety is a major part of our culture. Um, DEW is actually the first SHARP certified contractor in the United States, which is a certification that you get from the Safety and Health um, Achievement Recognition Program for going above and beyond OSHA standards. Um, we have been voted the best place to work by Vermont Business Magazine and New Hampshire Business Magazine several years, which we're very proud of. Um, and then this part's really important. Um, school construction is a major part of who we are. It was really our, our launching platform and our initial growth. We've, as of last year, we broke um, two billion dollars worth of work completed in our history, and 900 million, or close to 900 million of that is school and education construction projects. So our company has a lot of experience with this type of work. Um, we have a very strong bench um, as far as resources go. So, you know, we're not a company that's uh, overextending itself and doesn't have resources to leverage if the project needs additional project management support or field management support or administrative support. We have a good pool of resources that we can dip into and leverage to help the project, uh, you know, as, as far as that goes. Um, we we, uh, oh, the, the timing of this project is perfect for us. Our team here is actually finishing up a project that finishes in February or March of 24. So right now we're in the process of looking for a project to fill this slot starting in spring of 24. So if we don't get this project, we'll be looking for another one to fill the slot. So I offer that just in the context of the marketplace is really busy, construction managers are busy, subcontractors are busy, and, um, and we are in a situation where this project really works for us and would fit right into our, into our uh, portfolio right now. Um, and then before, right now we're going to transition to the team that we propose for the project. And Matt, just quickly before we get to that, yep. I just want to make a couple key notes. Each person on this team has worked together on numerous projects. So there's not people that haven't worked together, they've all worked together before. Um, each person has, uh, as you can see, each person has a lot of different school and education experience. So as far as not just the company has the experience, the people that we're proposing has the experience uh, necessary for this project. And, um, and then just the last thing I want to mention is each one of these people have um, had the opportunity to work a lot with the annual architects. So as far as the chemistry between the people that you see here on the screen and the teammates over at Vanwell and actually some of, you, some of the consultants I heard you mention, um, there's a lot of good chemistry there in partnership, years and years of experience working together. So um, I just wanted to offer that, Matt, before you get to introducing yourself. Sure. Yeah, there's... So Matt Wheaton, uh, Executive Vice President for DEW Construction. Uh, my focus at DEW is everything pre-construction, so estimating uh, and the pre-construction efforts. Uh, my background is architecture. I, the first half of my career, 
um, I designed schools. That's all I did. Um, so this is a natural fit. One, I can sort of work, I work well with no ego with our design team. Um, we find the best possible solutions uh, to bring those forward, and I now get to construct, which is really my passion anyways. So I love, what, I love design, but to construct is a little more satisfying for me. Um, so I'll let these guys introduce themselves, and then I'll follow up with the three individuals that are, that are not here in closing. Sure. Dan, uh, Dan Riley, I'm Vice President of Operations. If selected, I would be the project executive for the job. Um, I was the lead superintendent on the Wyndham project that we built with Banwell. It was a four-phase challenging project and um, as I said in the first interview to the team is that uh, if I have almost 40 years of construction experience, schools are a passion of mine for personal reasons and uh, there's no other team we would rather work with on that project than Banwell. Right, Jim. Great. Uh, Jim Kimball, project manager. Um, I'll be involved with your project from start to finish through warranty. Uh, I've, I'm getting close to 40 years in the New Hampshire construction market. Uh, I've done dozens of school projects um, of all different types. Uh, I've worked closely with Banwell uh, on a recent project and I look forward to working with you. A school project? A yeah. center school? Yeah. Steve? Steve Hart, I'd be uh, the superintendent. I'll be the boots on the ground. I'm the guy that you see every single day. Um, I'm also the type that's not going to come to you and say, I got a problem. I'm going to figure out what the problem is, come to you with solutions. Working with Banwell before, you know, we worked it out, we communicate. I mean, there was times, Ingrid, take a look at this picture. You know, I, you know, here's what I think. And off we go. So that's who I am. Okay. So, you know, when Taylor and I think about the team, when we structure a team coming in here, we make sure that we understand who the architect is, what the type, project type is, and we try to assemble the right fit team, both for personality, uh, local ge geography, um, who knows subs, et cetera. So this, this team was hand-selected. Um, <coughs> to make sure that they will, will, will meet the needs of the project. The three individuals that are not here, Mike Farm, Connor Donnelly, and Jim Gardner, um, all three are part of pre-construction. All three are very critical. Mike has numerous 60-plus uh, education projects, uh, mostly here in New Hampshire, that he's, he's worked on over the years as a project manager, but now he rolls into the pre-construction effort um, to leverage that, um, his skills there. Connor Donnelly, our in-house mechanical electrical plumbing um, engineer so, and estimator, critical. So he works through, I mean, a lot of these budgets, 30 to plus percent of your project budget is in mechanical electrical plumbing and fire protection. So having that brain on our projects is critical. We can troubleshoot, fine tune, make sure that you're getting uh, the best system um, that, that, that you need for the, for the project we're putting into place. <clears throat> Jim Gardner, excuse me. Um, is no slouch. Um, he can look at nothing and create an estimate that is quite magical. Um, he's, I work very well with him, everybody here works well with him. He's just an invaluable part of the team and I think the design team would echo that uh, sentiment as, as well. I think what we want to do, Taylor, is roll into the next, next slide, which is really sort of the, we touched on it a lot, we keep saying Banwell, 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 but we happen to work with them a lot. So as far as the sort of the chemistry, uh, the longevity, the proven track record, it's all there. We've got 25 years working with Banwell, uh, pushing 40 projects um, completed successfully. We have six right now um, that are sort of active or soon to be active. Um, and it's just a, a proven team period. They're very comfortable for us to work with. Um, so that chemistry that you're hoping for to, for everybody to come, it will come naturally with, with DDW um, and our, our team. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just add that um, from, from our founder and CEO down, it's been pounded into all of our heads that the most paramount thing on any project is the relationship with the client and the design team. Um, and every single one of us take that personally, and it, it is it, you, you will feel that camaraderie um, when we're brought on the team. It means a lot to us to have to establish a good working relationship 
and put the partnership first. We're not the company that's pulling out the contract, looking at the fine print, finding out how to take it. It's just not who we are. It's not our culture. We're very much a, a partnership. We've never not finished a project. We've never been replaced by another competitor on a project. Um, there's been numerous occasions where we've had to take over projects from competitors to solve financial challenges, but fortunately it hasn't happened to us. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that goal of partnership and relationship means a lot to us. Mr. So, um, Dan, you want to talk about Wyndham? <coughs> sure, just a quick recap <laughs> of the project itself. Um, the, the size of it, the 148,000 square feet in four phases. Let me step up here for a second. It is the currently the largest elementary school in New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> we did, I'm going to hit that part last actually, excuse me. We, we met the project budget without sacrificing the quality of the program. There were different challenges that we had throughout the project, um, whether it was a schedule at times, owner need, maybe some changes, some constructability, whatever it was, we managed to work with everyone and make it work. It was a, it was a great all-around team. We kind of look at this, you know, there's the three-legged stool, which is the contractor, the design team, and the owner, and we all stayed together well in that project. Um, <clears throat> one thing I do want to point out here is phase two of the project was 98,000 square feet, and we achieved temporary certificate of occupancy in 10 months. <clears throat> It was a lot of pushing, it was a lot of coordination, but we made it happen so that it worked for the operation of the district. And a lot of our focus throughout this project and every school project that we do is not just us building the school and handing it over to you. <clears throat> you know, we want to help set up your facilities team for success. We're going to point things out. We're going to help with the training of your team before we leave. We're going to be there for a warranty period and beyond. And um, this, for me personally, this was um, probably, someone asked me yesterday, what was the, what's a project that I was probably the most proud of? Um, and I said, and I mentioned this project. And I said it was this one because of, it really was like a case study in how well a school project can go. And I'm sure we can replicate this here in the for you. And just, just to add to one thing that I said, um, the public construction duration is, it was 16 months, it's now um, been adjusted to 14 months. Just, you know, obviously we'll have to look at the, the plans and, and, and vet the project scope with you guys, but we do see a tremendous opportunity to shorten that duration, um, assuming there's no wild card um, things that would push the schedule out. You know, we, we think that it should be able to be completed sooner than 14 months. Yeah, we, we view this, this is it 66.3, is that the square footage? 66.3, single level. I mean, this is, <clears throat> again, we need some more site information, but if this was on a perfect piece of land, this is one of the easiest buildings to, to construct. So uh, speed, efficiencies, uh, subcontractor interests uh, should all help push this project um, to meet uh, the budgets that, that are necessary. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the the as part of the fee proposal, a portion of it is general conditions. General conditions is directly correlated to the amount of time. You know, so um, if if we do determine as a group um, after we come on board that the uh, project schedule could be completed quicker than 14 months, the general conditions would be reduced. You know, but at a unit rate rate basis based on that time. So right now we've submitted a 14 month price for general conditions, um, but if the time shrinks, the price shrinks. I uh, just want to make that clear. So. And that was the second piece of paper, the, the text written inside of it. Did you, did you guys get it? Did you get a copy of that? No. Oh, you got them all? Oh. Um, anything else on Wyndham guys before? So the, just one of the last things we wanted to share with you guys is um, we really have our internal initiatives to really advance our use of technology and try to leverage the use of technology to help our clients um, and to just maximize our efficiencies and reduce costs. Part of, the, part of what we're doing is um, we're, the traditional process when we turn over a building um, at the time of occupancy is we're responsible for providing out-of-built drawings. 
and we're responsible for providing O&M manuals. So as a facilities group, the building can be managed for years and years to come. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is, um, it's, we do both, we still do the as-built drawings, but we uh, take 3D scans of the inside of the building through various points of construction, and that saves itself into a model that can be handed over to uh, the district. And, um, and if you're doing it at various points in time through the project, you can actually, on a mobile device or your computer, you can walk through the building and have a side-by-side -side comparison of different times in the project and actually be able to see in your walls or above your ceilings or below your slabs, you know, to, um, to identify where something was put in the wall, you know, and, and it, it, we've just found, we've received really good feedback. This is a project that we did um, in Westmoreland, New Hampshire, where the whole boiler room is tagged with all of the O&M um, documents so that you can kind of walk through the boiler room virtually and just click on the piece of equipment and the cut sheet pops up and you know what pump you need to buy to replace. Instead of having to go sift through a bunch of drawings and specs or folders, you know, on a computer, it's just a more user-friendly uh, mechanism for that. Yeah, we've, all, we've all been in boiler rooms where we ask the, the maintenance team, where's your, where your as built and they go and there's you know, coffee stain, rip corners, they, they get beat up, right? <laughs> so it, it's, we, we've, we use them, they're great. But with this, the, the O&M, or the operations and maintenance manuals, is, are all digital. We have a paper for those that enjoy paper. We have it digitally. And the nice thing about digital is we then transfer all of our trainings to this platform as well, so that if there's turnover within your district, the next person coming on that's in charge of whatever plant can come in and learn everything just as if it was day one being turned over because it's all it's all uploaded. Um, the other thing that it will do is, you know, down the road when my example is always you want to punch a door in this wall um, with the scans when you link them all together, you can go back and find that point in time and you can, if this was drywall, right? It doesn't matter, it's CMU. Um, you can see in that wall if there's a vent there or if you've got conduit running one way or the other or what's in there. Is there a bond beam in this wall halfway up? You can kind of see what's happening um, before you blow the hole and then say, oh, oh, geez, the main structural something or other is right through here. So um, it, helps, it helps you plan ahead when you want to do renovations down, down the road. <clears throat> And then um, I think the next slide is really just yeah, I mean, the at questions. this point, I'd love to roll into questions. Um, yeah, Chair Lynch. I've got a couple if I could. Uh, first, gentlemen, if the district decided to have a clerk of the works, if you had experiences with that in the past, can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can speak to it, I'm sure a lot of us can, but yes, I'm almost, um, I'd say not over 90% of our projects, there's a clerk. You know, so, uh, and by clerk, do you mean a full-time person on site or an owner's project manager or a combination of the two, maybe? A combination. Dictated yeah. by what we're doing in buildings and what the, yeah. the superintendent and the director of facilities recommends is something you just want to make sure that's not foreign. Or, yeah. No, no. Pretty common. It's actually, I want to make sure. It's actually pretty helpful for us because, um, yeah, so just to restate, you know, yes to your answer, over, I would say that well over 90% of the projects that we do have a clerk or an owner's project manager or a combination of the two. And it's the way that it, uh, I see the value is that it's assuming the entity, the person has experience in the industry, has done this before, it's a great uh, point person for us to go to um, instead of a big larger group and then that person can disseminate appro the appropriate information to a larger group um, and then bring it back to us and it, it's just an efficient way to communicate and there's a lot of communication that happens on a project like this. So uh, yeah, we're very comfortable with that process and actually prefer it. So. And it, it needs to, if if you, if you can, if the budget allows, having them on early is is key. Yeah. Because um, there's they, everybody has a day job, um, and that and that owner's project manager slash clerk when you get into construction, it's good to have them up front. It helps everybody. You know, it's it's our interface to the school, so I don't have to keep pinging Dave or something. You know, they they can they have the, the ear, and it's just a clean communication. Uh, the second question, the, the rendering model, is that Revit? No, that's, uh, there's, we use Cupus Works Instruction Site, okay. so there's two different products we use. Um, and Instruction Site is actually, we're, we're leaning, we're, we're liking that one more because um, we can just hand you a file at the end that you can open for 
t all time, right. and then Cupix tries to make money on it. So they say, yeah, we'll hand you the file, but you have to pay us every year. For it. Yeah. So, so it's uh, we, get, we we're kind of leading towards structuring the site. It's similar. Matterport is another one yeah. that, that we use, and that's more of a real estate sort of a, a tool. And they they do great things, uh, but you have to pay a subscription in order yeah. to maintain it. So as soon as I hand it over, you're going to have to yeah. pay or or it flops. <coughs> Send that information to Mr. Juicier. Yeah, absolutely. And then, just so we can see what the subscription if you do go with something that's a cost fix to it, yes. yeah. it's better. Yep. Yeah, yeah, just thank you. Yeah, absolutely. School board members have this? Um, Golden Brook School, great school. My ex my sister actually works there as a teacher, so she speaks by it. But I'm curious if, uh, with the number of schools that you've, you've constructed, are there any in this area, in the Seacoast? Or would this be your first school in the Seacoast? Um, yeah, this, you know, as far as this immediate seacoast area, this would be, uh, the Wyndham would likely be the closest one yeah. that I can think of. And we're, we, we're going to be working with Bo as well. Yeah. Um, and DEW, so DEW Construction has another entity, a development arm called DEW Properties. And DEW Properties has built two projects in uh, in Rochester uh, for the hospital. So we, we own an MOB up by the airport, and then we built a surgery center up by the airport, which we then sold back to the, the new hospital, if you will. What are you doing at Bo? Uh, we're doing a 13,000 square foot addition, so about eight classrooms, um, and then a full renovation, a uh, new sprinkler system, which is going to need a 30,000 gallon pump, or, or a storage tank pump, and then a new secure entrance. It's about a $12 million project. Is that Bo Memorial School or the high school? Bo Elementary. Uh, oh, okay. Councilman, Sorry about that. Uh, can you speak a little bit to your track record of projects being on time and under budget? I mean, what what do you have percentages you can provide in terms of how many are on time and under budget, or how many versus how many go over? Um, so th there's the total project budget and the construction budget. Um, so, you know, built into the total project budget is usually a contingency to account for unforeseen costs. You know, so we've never had to go back to the voters for more, for more money on any of our projects, period. Never. You know, we've never, what's that? Never. Never, right. And, uh, and, um, and we, we, we like to be involved in the assembly of the total project budget just to make sure that the project is covered from a total project cost perspective. Um, so to answer that portion of the question, we've never been in a situation where we've exceeded the total project budget on, on a project um, inclusive of the contingencies that are built into those budgets. As far as completing projects on time, you know, we, we have a great track record of completing projects on time and sometimes early. Um, there are always projects for whatever reasons, especially, you know, today is more challenging to predict um, some of the unforeseen things associated with procurement delays for materials and equipment, uh, you know, so um, we, we do our best to try to vet that stuff out in the pre-construction phase, which is the beauty of the construction management process, is you have an opportunity to do that. You're not just given a set of drawings and have to price it in three weeks. You know, it gives us the time to, for a year right now to plan and vet all this stuff out, talk to the manufacturers. So we really try to do as much research and homework as we can to dial in the construction schedule. But we've never, ever been laid on a school project opening for students. It doesn't matter what it takes. Working <clears throat> multiple shifts, weekends, Sundays, overtime, you do whatever it is. It's, that's, just, that's just the law of the land. You know, you never, you never not finish the school. I'll point back to when probably the, uh, the most aggressive, from a schedule standpoint, was the third phase of work at Wyndham, which was renovation work touching about 30,000 square feet. Not a total 30,000, you know, it's a rate of constructed schools, so a lot of fit up work, demolition, changing of use. That was, we were in roughly 30,000 square feet. It was just under $4 million worth of work. We executed under 10 weeks. And that was that was a seven day a week, 16 hours yeah, a day. Yeah, you just do whatever you have Whatever to it takes. You hit yeah. the point of no return about two yeah. hours into the project at the start of the summer. Yeah. And you know that. It has to open on time, and the teachers have to be coming in. And what's really nice is the subcontractor community, especially around here, the subcontractor partners around here, they all get it. You know what I mean? It's not like we're having to fight 
to Claw and Nails, although the resources trade in the trades is definitely a but challenge that's right now. Part, when, when we responded to Kyle and, and Dave with our initial response, we noted in there that you know this sort of 10, 10 month temporary certificate of occupancy so that things could start to move around, teachers could start to move in, start to prep and all that stuff. Um, we are we weren't that aggressive you know we, we still said in our initial response I forget what I wrote you know something like 14 months 13 to 14 months or something like that um, and that's that was being conservative right so we're, we're not bullish like we can do pre-covid schedule drive um, anymore right now we're, we're a little more uh, cautious with what we promise we make sure we plan with some buffers so that everybody expects, and we can either we can just exceed your expectations and not uh, not miss or fall short. So as far as schedule, that that kind of falls on me. I look at the schedule every week, do an update uh, when need be. We call the subs into the trailer, especially nowadays with you know lack of labor forces, uh, materials. We're always trying to look way ahead as far as the schedule, what they need. Um, right now we've even gotten to the point of printing out an individual schedule for each subcontractor so that all they have to do is go by the lines. And, and schedule is, that's my Bible. Every week I am looking at that. Every week they know Stevie is going to be knocking on your door where we're at, how come we don't have this or how come we have that. So schedule is extremely important. I just have one more question. Understanding what we're trying to achieve in Rochester and where this property is and what we're trying to get done in what seems to be a very constricted timeline, what are your concerns about the project? Do you have any, like, e to make you a little uncomfortable? Is there something in this project that makes you guys uncomfortable? Um, just speaking from my perspective, um, like Matt said, that based on what we know for information to date, the building seems um, predictable. It doesn't seem uh, doesn't seem like there should be any reason to expect any significant unforeseen challenges. Um, what we don't have a lot of information on at this point is the site. Um, we're very comfortable working, estimating, um, and executing really tough large site packages. We have um, a few site work contracts right now that are north of seven, eight million dollars. You know, so it's, it's we're, we're very comfortable working through that stuff. Jim Gardner, I'm pointing to the screen, doesn't have a space anymore, but Jim Gardner is a phenomenal site work estimator, and we have another gentleman in-house, Keith St. Sever, that comes from a site work background and concrete background, so that's where his specialty is. So that, to answer your question, it's, it's, there's not a tremendous amount of information we have, but the information we don't have typically what's under the ground is of concern. If there's wetland areas that have to be dealt with, again, we're comfortable with it. Just got to identify it. Does it impact the building, roads? And that's one of the first things we had to do right out of the ground yeah. is get, get the geotechnical information so we understand what's below, what your foundation design is, what kind of fill, structural fill has to come back in, all that sort of stuff. Because uh, that's a big budget issue. So if there's a big budget issue, we want to, we want to know it right out of the gate. Um, so geotechnical investigations, is it one of the first things? Will be? Yeah, yeah permitting timeline as well. Alterations for any of that. Another, another one for you is um, we have never seen anything like we are today as far as the need for us to provide the necessary supervision and management of the trades. There, and it, there's, there's a different quality of service you can expect from the people in the trades now, and there's a different volume of people in the trades. And so, and, and that's all affecting everything. It just trickles up, you know? And, and, um, and so, you know, we, we really, one of the most important things to do is to make sure we're generating interest in the marketplace about the project, the viability of the project, the reality of the project going, making sure that the key subcontractors in the marketplace, you know, that, that are going to be critical to get bids from, you know, make sure that they understand it's coming, that we're involved, we have great relationships with these people, and just, and, and it's, and we don't just assign the responsibility of, phone calls to subs to generate interest to a junior person. We, I will call subs myself, Matt will call subs, Dan will call subs, these guys up here will call the subs. 
So they're hearing from people they've worked with for years that they have relationships with, and they can, you know, they can get excited about the project because ultimately we need as much coverage as we can from the subcontractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Contractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, 
I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know? I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know? I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know? I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know? I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm Busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market, you know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their, in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know, I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just, that's a huge, just overarching concern, you know. I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up from when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. 
tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just that's a huge, just overarching concern. You know? I mean, when you talk about the site, I'm practicing up for when I come over here. Right now, I'm busting out ledge underneath I-95. Tractor market. You know, to make sure we keep the cost down and also have a project that people have in their in their workloads that they're planning on. So um, that's just. We're gonna come back to order for the committee, and we are going to welcome the next presentation of construction managers. Folks, we're back in session. So, this is uh, our joint building committee. This is Bowen Construction. I'll introduce Mr. Andre Klotz. Andrew's the president of the company. I'll let him introduce the rest of his team. And uh, there's just up and down buttons there. You can scroll through yourself. All right, if you could just give us a minute. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got some handouts, you can pass them over here. I can help you with that. Looks like you have enough hands done. Mind if we grab some chairs to just feel more? Absolutely not at all. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll yeah. Slide some over. I'm the office manager at Bowen Corporation, uh, also probably the one that will answer the phone if you call. To my left, <laughs> to my left here is Adam Downs, who is field superintendent, a partner of the company, and also my husband, Jesse Fand, who is assistant superintendent, project manager, Andre Klertz, who is project manager, executive, project exe executive, and Eric Cooper is not with us tonight, but he would be the mechanical, electrical, plumbing coordinator. All right. <clears throat> so a little bit about our company. We were founded back in 1991 uh, with a huge loan of $5,000. And uh, we paid that back next month after our first uh, requisition payment. Back in 1991, we were just starting into a recession, if you all remember. And we kind of burst on the scene, landing a series of projects totaling $5 million including a new bottling plant at Castle in the Clouds property in Multiborough, and then a new $2.5 million medical office building for Huggins Hospital six months later. We've never aspired to be a large construction company um, like the ones that Adam and I and his father had previously uh, worked for. Uh, we've remained relatively small, uh, but uh, have been highly successful, and I think we have a really good reputation throughout our time in business. The majority of the work we do is performed uh, on public uh, sector projects, uh, lots of schools, libraries, and municipal buildings. 
We greatly prefer using the construction management uh, form of project delivery um, because we think it fosters a team approach and a much level higher, much higher level of trust and confidence amongst the <coughs> members. So Bowen pretty much started um, with a bunch of us hanging out at my old grandfather's uh, old hunting camp up on the side of Osby Mountain. Um, my dad and Andre both worked for a general contracting firm, and I was a supervisor for a, a competing general contractor. Um, a lot of times at camp we're talking about all the different personalities that we work with between owners, architects, uh, all, the, all the people in the field, how to motivate them, how to build the best building you can be. Um, wasn't too many years of hanging out at camp that my father and Andre went off on their own to start a construction management company. Um, about a year later, they pulled me away from who I was with, and um, I, pretty, I pretty much left where I was because of the, they kind of went through a wish list of how, what they want to accomplish in, in construction. Um, some of the things that we really went over as far as goals were taking on those challenging projects, having a real open and honest relationship with clients, um, really establishing that team approach in construction between not just the owner and architect, but all the contractors involved, uh, right down to the guy pushing the broom on the job site, which most of the time is me. Um, paying your bills was important to us. Um, subcontractors, it's amazing. When you pay them on time, um, when we did Oyster River, the owner of the site work company was on site every day, and uh, they would send in the requisition. We would the day we got paid from Oyster River, my wife brought the check home, and I handed it to him the next day. So uh, when when you pay people promptly, he takes the check and says, "What do you need me to do?" Um, the amount of extra work and, and the devotion they put into a project when you show that much respect goes a long ways. Um, one of the things that was important to me is that we all, we all want to make a good living, but money can't be the driving force behind what we do. Uh, we want to get up every morning, no matter how challenging the job, and want to go to work. Uh, we want to get along with everyone on the job site. It shouldn't be a shouting match. You know, it's not the 70s and 80s anymore. Um, and show respect to all the people on the job site. And we found that when you show that respect, Everyone puts their heart and soul into a project, um, and that's to us that's very important. Um, Basically, we, we one of our big goals was we wanted our clients to enjoy their experience. Uh, if you think about it, everybody puts together their wishes, whether it's a fire department wanting a new fire station, a school district needing a new school. Uh, Clients are excited and, and they, they want to have a good experience doing their project. And that's one of, been one of the goals of our uh, company from day one, is to make the experience for our clients to be as enjoyable uh, as possible. And that even holds true when we invade somebody's building and have to work while they're trying to use it as well. And I think we have a very good track record doing that. So our, our proposed four-person uh, management team, we're fairly experienced. Uh, we can bring 140 years of combined construction experience onto the site, which we think is a real benefit uh, to our customers. The company's been in business for 32 years. And I really honestly can say I have the same enthusiasm as I did uh, when I started. We subcontract all parts of our projects. Um, the only thing we do is provide management, supervision, and some general labor and carpentry work when necessary. We found that that's a, a very important thing when you're out soliciting bids from subcontractors because we never compete with them. We don't have a site work division. We get site work bids from everybody because they know we're not going to look at their numbers and give it to our ourselves. On to the next one. Um, <clears throat> so our experience building schools, we worked in uh, 
17 different secondary school projects, I'm uh, sorry, in 17 different secondary schools. In many cases, we've been invited back into these facilities on more than one occasion to do repeat work for them. Um, we've also done multiple school projects for six, six different <coughs> SAUs. So we like to think that that's because they like their experiences with us. The same holds true for Plymouth State University. Uh, we've done uh, over 20 projects uh, at the uh, university and uh, some other ones at various colleges in the community system and at UNH as well. We'll talk about a couple of those later on. But the big thing is whether a project is 50,000 or 50 million, we manage it the same with professionalism, care, and are, we're proud to say that they're on time and within budget. All right, <clears throat> now we'll talk about three or four projects that we've completed of late. The first one is Alton Central School. It's one of the places where we've been invited back a number of times. Um, the largest one we did for them was back in 2014. This was a combination addition of classrooms on one side of the school and a new administrative wing on the other. And by the way, they wanted to sprinkle their entire school. Um, and that was about 87,000 square feet total. And the plan was to use the town's hydrant system to do that. Um, as we began the project, <coughs> we found out that uh, the town's water system was having issues and could no longer, su no longer supply the pressure and uh, volume that was needed for the sprinkler system. So working with the architects of the school, we came up with an alternate <coughs> system using uh, storage tanks and pumps. Because the problem was the cost of that was way beyond anybody's contingency. <coughs> this was a bid project, not a CM project. Luckily, the project went across two fiscal years in the school cycle, so they were able to go back to voters at March, explain the problem, and get the money allocated for the sprinkler system. We were still hoping that the uh, water department would fix their problems. We gave the school a drop date of when we absolutely had to order all the components, and they kept asking for as much time as possible, and we had promised to turn the school over to them to start the school year the following August. Well, we waited till the very last <coughs> second. It didn't get fixed, so we put the system in for them. And uh, we're proud to say that with, despite all the challenges, despite them adding $700,000 worth of work to a $3.2 million original contract, that we got the project completed on time and within the ultimate budget that we gave them. Adam, anything to add to that? Yeah, a couple, a couple challenges at uh, ACS was, uh, one, uh, it was in a school that they were using daily. Uh, the two additions were on complete opposite sides of the building. So the logistics of dealing with bus, parent drop-off, and, and one of the administration wing was right at the, at new, at the entrance. Um, and so, just the handling of keeping kids safe um, throughout that process through the winter. Um, we were, it was, went really well, never had any issues between workers and um, any of the students. We did background checks on everyone that was on site, which we felt was important because we were in such con close contact with, with the students and the faculty. Um, One, one kind of neat thing about working and traveling between one edition and the other throughout the year was um, uh, right in between the two editions was the STEM classroom. And the teacher was, actually that year, she was New Hampshire's Teacher of the Year. Um, but she was really involved with making this whole construction project part of her classroom. Um, so I spent probably almost once a week would go in go over the plans. Um, in the beginning it was, now remember we started this project two weeks before the start of school, so we were right in everyone's way. But we spent a lot, you know, I spent a lot of time going over 
concrete, steel, masonry, means and methods, right down to the finishes at the end of the school year. So it was kind of a neat opportunity for these kids um, to see the bright side of construction. Um, and so that was that was a real that was real fun. So Mr. Rupert. <coughs> oh, I've, sorry. Keep going. All right, um, Effingham School, another school uh, that we built um, that was an entirely new school, and um, the new school was located just down the road from the existing. Um, when I think about that school, I don't know if anyone knows <coughs> Al Quixelius. Um, he's CMK architect. CMK. But when we first got that job, he would come in every week to the meeting and and growl and say, where's the money? Um, it was 24,300 square feet, and, our, and we built it for 2.4 million, so it was under $100 a square foot. So I can't even imagine what that cost would be today. He would not be very pleased, I don't think. Um, but that was another very rewarding job. Um, the teachers that were in that existing school, basically were working, it looked like a closet they were all crammed into. Um, and it was probably less than a quarter of a mile, but at least once a week, um, they did a field trip with every student in that school, marched them down the road, no matter what the weather, um, and we did a tour around the perimeter, and when it was safe enough, we gave them tours in through the building, almost weekly. Um, but when we turned that school over, there was so much enthusiasm, um, between the faculty and the students, um, that it was it was real enjoyable um, on that on that project. Also, uh, when we were doing that, um, I had two young kids then, but Bob the Builder was in its heyday, so I was known as Bob the Builder. I even had a they got me a sticker for my hard hat. So. so probably everybody's <clears throat> aware of. Oyster River's latest building. We get, became involved with the project back in 2018. We actually had the um, privilege of getting a sit in on the architectural <coughs> selection, um, and that was very interesting for me. And uh, we came on board um, early in 2018, began working with the architectural firm to begin, you know, doing numerous fact finding sessions on what was uh, desired by the you know, people of, of uh, the school district. We began preparing schematic budgets and uh, first on the schematic design and then on design development drawings. In October of 2019, uh, we developed a GNP budget for them based on <coughs> still outline specifications and drawings that were less than 50% developed in many of the disciplines. This was in preparation of the following March vote. We requested civil, concrete, and steel drawings and specifications kind of be fast-tracked a little bit. And we were able to bid these portions out enough to that uh, we were able to tentatively select uh, low bidders on this, uh, those sections. <coughs> and that was huge. Uh, you know, the low bidders were all told you're contingent upon project approval, but they all began working to prepare for that project. And when it received its approval, we were able to get them on board right away, and that really helped us get started on May 1st. Uh, that proved to be a key element in uh, meeting the tight construction schedule that we had, you know, for the 143,000 square foot building, four stories high, and uh, working alongside the school that they were all, the kids were all still attending. Uh, additionally, uh, getting the early start allowed us to stay just ahead of the COVID crunch, which was huge. And um, we, we estimate that just in one, one year, had we been uh, behind that curve and started to experience all of the price increases that happened, that school might have been $8 million more in, in costs. So being proactive uh, really paid off for us. So as he said, construction began in May of 2020, with faculty and staff moved in just after winter break in 2022. Not only is it a LEED Gold certified project, but it's also New Hampshire's first net zero public school. 
a source of great pride for the students, community, and all involved in the construction. This was achieved with a high efficient, highly efficient envelope, which is heated and cooled with a ground source heat pump system, featuring 70 500-foot wells. The four-story building utilizes extensive high-efficiency glass for natural lighting and has a great deal of interior glazing to facilitate a feeling of continuity and inclusiveness. This is largely, largely achieved through two um, two-story student dining and learning commons punctuated by um, two rooftop skylights. And if you look at the uh, picture, it's the upper right-hand picture. Um, another feature is the 900-seat acoustically tuned concert hall, which supports this, uh, the, not only the school, but the uh, school district's music program. Um, during construction, students continue, continue to attend classes in the existing building, right next to the new school being built. Phase two of the project consisted of demolishing the old building, removing significant amounts of ledge, and installing a new artificial turf field to be used by the school sports and physical education programs. And uh, something else I didn't mention was that the electricity needed for the school was supplemented by a large array of photovoltaic panels as well as water heating panels. So not only do we have solar panels on all of the roofs of the building, but we also put in a um, carport, which we put, um, put photovoltaic panels on as well. So that's how the school um, was able to achieve um, net zero. So <clears throat> back to Oy Server, staying with Oy Server, um, that definitely was our most challenging um, but yeah, rewarding project um, in the history of our company. Um, it was our largest job by a long shot. Um, I was a little apprehensive at first about taking on that project um, <clears throat> because I'm, I'm not a trailer guy. I'm not the super that um, enjoys spending eight hours in the trailer pushing paper. Um, I'm kind of a, in the trenches with the guy super. Um, one of the benefits of that job and, and having Jesse on board full time was with his skill set on, um, with his steel background and, and with the, you know, these young guys know how to use computers a heck of a lot better than I do. But um, it enabled me to be out in the field doing what I do best. I've done this for almost 40 years, um, but we really attacked this whole project with a team approach with all the subs. Um, Every sub, every person to a man on that job, and we had up to 150 people on the job um, at some point. Um, said it was the most rewarding, smoothest, enjoyable project they've worked on. Um, <clears throat> and I've had even like Miller Testing did all the civil testing, and within two months we were on the site going over some things, and he said there's something different about this place. Everyone's working together. You know the plumbers. No, they're not fighting with the site guy digging trenches. Um, electrician is helping the plumber if he's moving something. So we just really put in the team approach on that project and it carried all the way through to the end. Um, it, was, it was pretty fantastic to see. And I think you get that when you show respect to the guys out you know, working with you. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm in the trailer and it's snowing and raining and, and they have that one little question that I want them to ask me. They're not going to get their coat, take the tool belt off, walk 100 yards across the site to come see me in my company trailer. Um, I got to be out on the field with the guys. I literally answered questions from 6 o'clock until 4, 5 o'clock every day. The day goes by fast, but we never really took a step backwards because me being in the field with the guys, any little hiccup that happens, and Prince. No matter how good the architect is, they can't be perfect. There's always little things we got to tweak. So if I'm, if I'm in the trailer, they're going to hesitate to ask that question because they don't want to be held up. But if I'm out there with them, they ask the questions, we resolve it. And even if it's a slight change, as long as they don't have to do it twice, they're not going to charge it, they're not going to send out a change order, which I can't stand. So it just makes the job go smooth. We never took a step backwards on that, on that project, so it was, it was a very exciting job for us. Okay. <clears throat> the last uh, but not least was a very interesting project we did uh, 
uh, back in 2018. So this was uh, a advanced technology building for the Manchester Community College. And this is a uh, lab that teaches students about HVAC, uh, plumbing, electric, and something that I didn't know at the time what it meant, but mechatronics, which is kind of a combined <coughs> engineering science of both uh, mechanical, electrical controls and automation. So this is like a living lab. There are 14 different classrooms that give them the opportunity to work with air handlers, chillers, boilers, and latest automation technologies. So they can kind of get their hands on almost anything in this building. And it seems to have been very successful for them. Uh, a lot of mechanical contractors contributed to the funding of this and are pulling students out of it very regularly. All right, kind of a, a favorite subject of ours is why we love doing schools. So we've talked about this a lot already. Um, working uh, within schools presents great educational opportunities, and we enjoy working with faculty to create interest with young people for our profession. It's very important, and a lot of teachers buy into this and, and will ask us to develop some math problems that show their students, hey, how, how do I... Uh, use this math you're teaching me. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for us, and we like being involved uh, as, as much or as little as teachers want us to be. And I realize, you know, in an, in an elementary school, it would probably be a lot more basic. But again, we feel strongly that a new building, it, it offers educational opportunities uh, for students. My turn. So the first school project I ever ran as a supervisor was, uh, and I'm dating myself, was actually with Andre um, in 1985, I think, so a couple years ago. Um, we've done a lot of school projects since. We enjoy building something that is appreciated. Um, teachers, faculty at these schools usually are overcrowded. Ventilation is usually subpar. Um, not enough room, not enough storage. So when you when you build a school, it's probably the greatest sense of satisfaction, and you never get, you never have people walk by you. I still at Oyster River when I if I go back, they thank me. Um, I, it's been done for a year and a half, um, but they are still so excited about having great working conditions. You know, teaching is hard enough, just dealing with all these students without um, having poor conditions to work in. Our daughter's a teacher, uh, Jesse's fiance is a teacher, um, Andre and our partner that just retired, his wife um, was a teacher for 40 years, she just retired from Interlakes. So we've, we've got a long history of building schools and dealing with uh, people in education, and it's kind of our passion. Um, we really get a sense of pride when we turn over a school, whether it's a whole new school or just renovating a classroom for someone. Um, we were working at a school in Wolfboro, Carpenter Elementary School, and the only area in the building on this renovation project was the kitchen office area, which was down in the basement, concrete floors, just poor, poor conditions. And they were kind of complaining one day that their area was the only area that wasn't being renovated. So the, um, the kind of the head of maintenance at the school district, um, when they left at 2 p.m., he and I went in and worked until probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, put new floors down, painted the walls, added an acoustical ceiling. Um, and when they, So they left at 2 in the afternoon. They show up at 5.30, 6 o'clock to start breakfast for the kids the next day. Well, we ate like kings for the rest of that project. <laughs> they were so happy. Um, but it's just those little things you can do for these um, people that work in these schools that really uh, makes a difference. So. Um, another quick point is why we give tours is, and Jesse will touch on it a little bit, but when you finish the school, if you've given these students and faculty tours, as simple as it sounds, when, when they first move in and they have that first day of school, there's, not that, there's no shock and awe, and they're not, the learning curve is so much decreased, and the level of stress is, is so much lower that 
when they, the first day at Oyster River, by uh, every teacher I talked to, by mid-morning, they were right in full learning mode, right from day one, because the kids had been in the building a number of times, done a walkthrough, so they weren't, they weren't that shocked about moving from one school to the other. They literally moved out for one week, went on vacation, came back, and they hit the ground running. Um, so we feel that's an important thing to do. With it's all a matter of building a culture. You know, that's the same approach we have um, you know, with our relationships with the school district, with our subcontractor. It's just fostering an environment where everybody works together. And uh, you know, whether it's having them involved with signing the last beam to, um, you know, to be hung on the building or hiring you know, lo local high school seniors to work on our work as labor. It's just a matter of building respect for the pro project and, and you know, really a sense of uh, teamwork. All right. So on the next three slides, we're going to talk just quickly about kind of how we handle a project from start to finish. Um, so in the pre-construction phase, we begin by familiarizing ourselves with the site and building requirements. We begin, begin preparing schematic cost estimates of the various options being considered and prepared by the architects. So this can, can, can include how many floors to have, you know, what's the structural framing system going to be, and material choices, you know, types of insulation, siding, interior finishes. We can pro pro provide pricing for lots of different options. Mechanical systems, looking at different types of systems that might be considered for the new elementary school. We then identify the tasks that we need to do to facilitate permitting and the development of drawings and specifications. A site investigation will be, will be performed and summarized to develop a pre-construction and preliminary construction phase schedule. We think that's very important so that all the members of the team have kind of a card of what we have to follow and know when the dates that things have to be done have been well established. So as we say, we create a preliminary line item budget during the schematic phase and we keep updating that as drawings are developed um, through the design development phase and as quickly as we have enough information and as quickly as the school requires it, will generate a GMP. Um, you know, we do the uh, value engineering and cost saving suggestions right throughout the project as things are brought up. We try to analyze them with the architect, and help them decide what the most cost effective materials uh, that are, should be used, and we'll keep doing that right to the end. We also attend all required project meetings as well as any informational sessions and presentations to help promote the project to the public. Uh, once project approval is received, we would work with the design team to monitor costs while drawings are finalized. The next step would be to publicly bid the project in preparation for a spring start date for construction. So on this, as part of working as a team, you know, we'll tabulate bid results, share all the bids with the building committee and, and uh, SAU members, and we all together, you know, make our team selection as far as the subcontractors and suppliers. We'll give you our recommendations. Uh, you may have a company that's local, that has uh, done a lot of work for the school district, and you may think they're the best fit for the project. So these are all things that, you know, we'll work together on determining. And as soon as we've come up with uh, the ch choices and finalists, we'll update the AIA contract to reflect a final schedule of values and also uh, incorporate the contract documents that uh, Banwell has created and, and finished so that the, uh, the final contract will reflect their work. Um, final step would be of the pre-construction phase is um, to write subcontracts and purchase orders that will issue to the subcontractors and the suppliers that we choose. So, once all that boring stuff is done, um, I can get going. Uh, a couple weeks before we actually break ground, I'll start spending time with um, and meeting with the local code enforcement, 
um, public safety officials, uh, sub, the, the major subcontractors, and kind of develop a logistics plan, um, review the site, safe access, different truck routes. Uh, we'll talk to the BPW on what they recommend for truck routes in the area. Delivery times, uh, be in contact with um, people in the school as far as the safest time to have material moved in and out, um, depending on the vicinity of the addition or the new building. Um, proper fencing, dust control is important, especially if you're going any near a residential area. Um, touch base with any neighbors that have any concerns. Do that ahead of time. Um, you, we want to be ready when we start a project, not to try to play catch up and put out fires once you've started. Um, so that's all, all things we would handle before we put a shovel on the ground. Um, and once construction starts, um, we have weekly job meetings, um, meetings with the architect and owner, but I also have weekly meetings with all my major subs uh, in the trailer, review scheduling, upcoming you know, hot, hot ticket items. Um, and just proper plan. So, while he's doing his thing in the office, he'll start collecting submittals <clears throat> and getting them re reviewed and sent over to the architect's office. We also try to provide the architect with a what's called a submittal schedule, which they'll share with their consultants. So that kind of helps them prepare for the onslaught that sometimes happens of submittals. And we work with the uh, architect and sub, her, their consultants to kind of figure out what's the most important ones to process first. And this, this helps everybody from getting too stressed because at times we'll send a lot of submittals. Um, <clears throat> construction can begin as soon as uh, you know, materials are approved by the submittal process. And um, you know, we'll have periodic safety inspections on site. Um, we'll help uh, the owner select a testing agency. It's typically, although we've done it both ways, but most typically uh, the testing agency wants to work for the owner. And we'll help you select one if you need our help. And uh, <clears throat> it's very important that we're on top of not only the testing, but the special inspections, so that they're always being scheduled at the right times. Uh, and uh, that's that's, uh, and nowadays it's a big priority to get those properly scheduled. We, uh, <clears throat> we try to hold periodic safety inspections. At some times of the project, we, we have them even on, on a weekly basis or twice a week. Other times it's maybe every two weeks. It all depends on uh, the intensity of the project at any particular time and what's going on. Uh, we prepare billings on a monthly basis. Uh, they're sent to the architect for review and approval, and then they are sent to the SAU. Uh, we again make the plea that as fast as they can be processed, uh, there's a huge advantage to paying our subcontractors on time. A happy subcontractor, when there's so much work out there, if you're the ones paying them the best, you're going to get uh, the best service. And, and Oyster River and many other projects that we've done has proven that to us and our clients. So we try to work very hard with, with our customers, <clears throat> with the architectural firm, so that the review process goes quickly and efficiently and we can get them paid as fast as possible. Uh, we also will go and present uh, monthly waivers of liens that are collected uh, after we pay the subs promptly, we send those to the architect with our following month's requisition. So there's always proof that uh, everybody's getting paid as they should be. Okay. Uh, so I'll quickly touch on the closeout phase. Um, by the time our project's near completion, Adam's already prepared and completed our own pre-punch list prior to requesting an official one from the project architects. Um, you know, this is to kind of minimize their work and the, their consultants' work when they perform the official inspections with the owner. Um, we'll, also, um, we'll also prepare operating and maintenance manuals. Um, we'll perform or we'll uh, facilitate the um, commissioning agents in their 
um, testing and the reports that they um, that they provide. Uh, so then, a final testing report is presented um, to the architect, and um, we'll also we'll also coordinate all owner training sessions between any um, any pertinent subs and perform um, training with the, the maintenance and administrative staff of the school. Um, you know, we'll do a full walkthrough with the O and M manuals and the asphalt drawings to make sure everybody is comfortable. So uh, this is our updated fee schedule based on uh, a change from a 16th to a 14th month project schedule. Um, we also received some guidance on what should be included in general conditions, so we've uh, modified our original proposal on those. So you can see uh, pre-construction is 35,000, construction phase percentage is 2.5% as, as is any changes in the work. And the uh, general conditions, which currently is, includes a four-person staff, and we would just say that we still have some flexibility there, depending on what we learn about the project. Right now, we don't know that much about the mechanical system. We we were very very busy at Oyster River, trying to monitor the uh, geothermal systems, the photoelectric. It, it added a lot of extra work. It may not be necessary to have you know, a full four-person staff. Uh, so that's something we can still talk about. And this is just a breakdown of the general conditions. Um, as I said, that MEP coordinator might, might be able to do that less, for less money. Michelle? <clears throat> Our funding and insurance. The Raleigh Agency has been our insurance and bonding agent for over 30 years. Our bonding program is through the Berkeley Insurance Company provides support for individual projects of $50 million <coughs> with a maximum bonding capacity of $60 million. Baum maintains all necessary general liability, workers' compensation, umbrella, and professional liability insurance coverages. Browley provides an annual insurance audits and continual guidance so that our insurance program is always comprehensive and well-maintained. So one thing that's important to us is, is our safety. Um, when I think of safety programs, it's not just something in writing. Um, I look at safety as part of quality control, the attitude on a job site, um, our ability to give tours with select board, building committees, public safety, uh, the fire department, police department, uh, faculty, and the students, all kind of coexist with having a safe, organized, clean job site. Um, all these people that work on these jobs, they really want to work on an organized, clean job site. Um, if they start with that and you enforce it, uh, they buy into it. Um, it's a safe job. It goes, you don't have any hiccups. The quality, the end product comes out much better. Um, I probably don't have the brain space to be putting out fires for nine, ten hours a day if I'm, if my job site looks like a storage shed. You know, it, it has to be organized and clean so I can, I can do my thing. Um, but we, we are really fortunate um, on our safety end that we, we've had real good sex with that. Yeah, we, you know, we also, we, um, just to get an extra fresh set of eyes on the, um, on our safety policies, we do hire an outside consultant um, contractors risk management to perform weekly safety inspections and also provide consulting for our cor corporate safety programs. You know, like I said, it's a fresh set of eyes and it also kind of informs us, us of the current best practices. Okay, that's it. So, last slide. We thank you all for inviting us here today. You know, for your time and your consideration. Uh, in the handouts that we've given you, there is an appendix uh, with a bunch of additional pieces of information that we don't want to talk about today, but you're welcome to look at. And I'm sure you have some questions, so fire away. All right, we'll take uh, about two minutes for questions. Would like to start? Chair Lynch? 
Um, have you had any schools where you've worked with state-funded projects? Yes, over the years, a number of the ones in, uh, I think it was District 79, were state-funded. Uh, how many employees do you have total? What are we at right now? Eleven? Nine. Nine. So it's it's really mostly management and supervisory personnel. Um, geographically, you guys seem to be doing more work away from the Seacoast, which really seems to be the more central one to us. Um, did you have any problems maintaining and managing subs? No, not we, at all. We've had such good success with subs. Um, I guess, like we reiterated, we pay well, we're respectful, we give them. When subs show up on our job site, they know, if I've scheduled them to be there on Tuesday, they know it's 100% ready for them to show up on Tuesday. Um, we've never had any issues with subs. They're, they're always looking to work with us. Uh, we know we'll give them the, an honest chance to make a living, um, so we've never had any issues. No. The thing every sub said on the way out of Oyster River was, was when is the next one? When, when is the next one? When, yeah, when can we do this again? Any other questions from the committee? Thank you so much. You must much. have a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank you, guys. Construction, and I'll give it over to you. But 30 minutes for presentation, and about 15 minutes, just uh, quit. There we go. Oh, the pitch 
There you are. Page up, page down. I can handle that, I think. Are we good to go? You're good to go, sir. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. And yes, I, I am a little technologically incompetent, I have to tell you. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, my name is Rob Prunier. I'm one of the owners of Harvey. And uh, we're thrilled to be here today. With me, uh, just so you can put a name and a face together, although you can here, um, uh, Keith Kelly is, is the director of planning and pre-construction for us. So between now and when we actually move ground, Keith will be one of the key people helping to put estimates, procurement, schedules, uh, strategies in terms of logistics and things of that nature together. Uh, he'll be working closely with Paul Kent, who may, you may know. Um, Paul is our project superintendent. He'll be on, on the job site all day, every day. Um, and you may know Paul from his previous experience at the high school and at, at Gonick. And then Kathy, Kathy Misko was our senior project manager, and she will be the conduit between um, tomorrow, if we're so fortunate to be in, being a part of this team, and, and through, through move-in. Um, she'll have a whole team of people that'll, that'll be working with her that we'll, we'll show in a minute. Um, but in essence, the four of us are four people that you'll be dealing with from start to finish. <laughs> what we're trying to do today, uh, and we're going to go real fast, especially since we have Celtics fans here. Um, <laughs> we, re we really wanted to just identify some of the things that are, we felt were probably important to you and tell you a little bit about how we're going to address those things. Um, first and foremost is the culture. Harvey's been around since 1939. Um, my partner and I are the fifth generation of owners of the company, but we, we try, we've tried to grab onto everything that made Harvey successful for all these years. We've updated ourselves in terms of technology and sophisticated people. Uh, Pre-construction is an example where we have seven people that are working full-time just planning our projects. Um, but we still like to live by, the, by the, the, what made Harvey great, and that is that we, we are open and transparent. We're team players. We ask a lot of questions. Sometimes, you know, we, we ask a lot of questions and I get the heebie-jeebies because we're asking so many, but to be honest with you, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, the architectural engineering and, and, and subcontractors are all saying, thank you for asking all those questions. You close gaps, you connect the lines, you answer questions that down the road could have been change orders. So our team, Keith's team, is very focused on making sure that we put a plan together that's going to work for you. Um, very quickly, um, I, I mentioned we're, we've been around since 39. We're a safe company. Our experience modification rating is 0.74. Um, we have been with travelers for, I don't know, 25 years at this point. They're our bonding company. We have a strong relationship with them. 95% of what we do is construction management, so we're often getting involved at the cocktail napkin uh, stage of a project and trying to help uh, develop the plan and making sure that everything's in place before we hit, hit the ground. <coughs> our, we think our process works. 70% of what we did in 2022 was for repeat clients. That's generally where we've been for the last 20 years. We've been in 65 to 70% of our work has been for people that we've worked with before. And, th and schools make up about 30-35% of our, of our in, um, portfolio every year. I'm going to skip through this. I have this and I'm going to leave it for you afterwards, by the way. Um, I, guess, I guess real quick though, um, we, we are 100% open book, 100% of any of the savings that we find We'll go back to the school district. I feel that that's very important for you to understand. Um, and as a New Hampshire-based firm, you're, you, you are directly impacting the economy when you work with Harvey. Um, the, the Dennis DeLay, who was an economist for public service in New Hampshire for a long, long time, uh, he, he would continually tell me, every dollar that stays in New Hampshire turns into $2 for the local economy. That's changed. It's now $3 for the local economy. So every dollar that stays with, in New Hampshire, and with Harvey, every dollar stays in New Hampshire, um, that turns into impact on the local economy. As I mentioned, schools are a big part of our work. Paul and Kathy collaborated on, on the CTE expansion at Spalding. And we also put as what's affectionately called as the bathtub uh, at Gonic. When, we, when there's that emergency situation over there, we jumped on it and, and tried to help you out. We do, we do a lot of schools from the ground up. Um, these are three examples of uh, middle uh, elementary schools that we did in Concord, all about the same size, ranging from 65,000 to 72,000 square feet. <coughs> These schools were a little bit more in terms of there was a lot of demolition that had to go on. Uh, two, two of the three had schools 
had to come down first. Um, and those ranged in today's dollars, in 2023 dollars, those were in that $350 square foot range, 325 to 350. Um, right now, Kathy's very involved with the Brian McCarthy Middle School in Nashua, which is a large school. It's a much different um, <coughs> program that we're talking about. It's a middle school. It's four levels up. Uh, and that's coming in at around $410 a square foot uh, in today's dollars. So from a budget perspective, we think you're, in pretty good, you're, you're trending in a pretty good spot um, moving forward based on square footage and the fact that it's an elementary school program. <coughs> As I mentioned, um, we have a group of people that are going to be supporting the four of us throughout this process. Here in this bottom left-hand corner, that's the group that will work with, with Keith, um, putting together estimates, looking at opportunities to, to find better and more cost-effective ways to, to uh, put, put the school together, working closely with Ingrid and her team and her group of engineers. The civil engineer is going to be a key part of this um, based on the site that, that, you, that you're working on. Uh, as we move into the construction side of things, again, Kathy being the conduit, uh, Senan, who has worked with you as well in the past, will, will help Kathy on the project management side of things, and then Paul um, will be on the construction side every day. Two things I just want to point out in this org chart, one being um, we still do layout engineering. It's a little bit of the old school that we hang on to from the old Harvey. We like to find the corners of the building. We like to find where walls are going. You can rely on the subs to do that, but we prefer to do it ourselves. So we still do that. It's a little old school. And, and Matt, yes, so related to Kathy. Um, Matt is our ME, one of our MEP coordinators, mechanical, electrical, plumbing coordinators. He gets involved on in the early stages. He's also, he works all the way through commissioning. So he's, he's involved with both stages of the project, beginning and end. <coughs> I should have said, if you have any questions, please throw something at me or scream or give me a signal. Um, we are very much committed to the team effort. As I mentioned, 95% of what we do is construction management, so we have to be part of the team. We're typically in at that conceptual schematic phase of the project, uh, and we help to, to get to that GMP so that you're, you've got a price and a program and a schedule that you're comfortable with and you, and you're, you know that it's going to uh, come to fruition. We also know um, that there's a lot of people that you have to communicate with. Uh, we're committed to doing that with you in various ways, whether it be the website or handshakes or meetings, whatever it might be. Um, there's a lot of people that have to be informed, not all of them at the same time, um, but at various parts of this project, whether it's the building department, the fire department, uh, neighbors, uh, school the, the, sc the school board, um, whatever it may be, um, we're known for being able to communicate with everyone and keeping everyone up to speed as to where we're at. <laughs> in terms of communicating, um, we do put together monthly reports that would come to this committee or to, to whomever we're we're reporting to, and that, that on a monthly basis tells you where we're at in the project, schedule updates, cost updates, where change orders are, where RFIs are, requests for information, um, two-week look-aheads, uh, logistics changes, whatever it might be, comes in that package for you so that you, can, you have the answers to a lot of the questions that you need uh, to answer as, as things move along, and you're also very well informed about where we are in a financial and schedule perspective. Again, that pre-construction phase is a, it's a really important part of what we do. We're really strong uh, in, in, the, in the field and building buildings and, and getting them done on schedule. That's in part because of such a focus that we put on the pre-construction and the planning stages. I say in part. I don't mean the low, uh, very important part, Keith. We have looked at the project um, and we've started to sketch out a schedule. This is something that has just been, kind of been in our, in our office at this point. Uh, one of the first things we would do is we would sit down with Ingrid and her team and the school district and the civil engineers and start talking about how we reconcile this. So this is just to kind of give an idea of how we see this laying out. Um, we, we, we think that 14 month duration is a very doable duration. We, we had started with 16 months, but that 16 months was a lot of unknowns. And as we, get, as we start to understand what's going on in terms of the site, in terms of the program, we'll be able to tighten that up and start to bring in dates that, that the architects and the engineers are, are, need to get their design done, approvals, whatever it might be. We'll track that and we'll make sure that you have this information on a regular basis. Let's get to there. Our estimates are, are, are very detailed. 
Um, again, that gives us the opportunity to dig, dig in a little bit and find out where, we're, where you're spending money, um, whether it's mechanical, electrical, plumbing, which we do. We have in-house um, uh, ability to, to look at that, which can be 40, 50% of the project. <coughs> um, but, but when we get together and we go through budgets and our estimates, you're going to see every detail in there. How many doors, how many windows, what the flooring is. Um, everything will be there so that you can make smart decisions. We also run variance reports um, on when we need to. It can happen any time. That variance report will put one estimate next to the most current estimate, the last estimate next to the most current estimate. And that allows us to look and see, and if the mechanical system, for example, the budget is $250,000 off, that makes us direct our attention to, the, to that line item and think about it. If doors are $1,500 off, we might not need to spend as much time thinking that out. Um, so that variance report becomes a very important part of, the, part of our pre-construction process. We also, if you want to jump in, just jump in. I want to roll, though. That's it. <laughs> um, we also keep value engineering logs, value management logs, so that we can look at alternative ways of, of producing materials, systems, um, equipment, so that you can make the decisions on which direction you want to go. You can see if one flooring type is a little bit less money than another, you can make that decision. But we look for those opportunities to give you choices. And to, and to make sure that we're driving the budget down to, as, to the absolute minimum that we can, meeting all program expectations and quality. We did learn last time we met um, and about the site a little bit. And we, you know, we, we just want you to know that we are very in tune with uh, how to deal with piles, if necessary, because of the soil stabilization issues that you may have on that site. Um, we know the subcontractors, we know how much they cost, we know the different various options that are out there. Um, there's a lot that goes into analyzing what kind of foundation and structural system that you're going to use. Um, but we're, we're going to be there to help you answer the questions, give you the information you need, um, give Ingrid's team the information they need from a structural and a civil perspective and geotechnical perspective. Um, and we, and we, it's not unusual. New Hampshire's a tough place to build. Uh, the piers and piles are often part of the process. Um, but we got you back is really what I'm getting, what I'm getting to. <laughs> In terms of sustainability, it's become almost a, a it hasn't become a, it's not a specialized thing anymore. It's almost a part of every project that we're involved with. Um, whether it's solar, which we seem to do on almost every building that we, that we build these days, or geothermal, or locally, um, locally procured materials, um, recycled materials, recycling construction debris. We try to bring as much of that to the table as we possibly can. We, we track it. Uh, it comes into that report that we do on a monthly basis. Um, but it gives you, we, we can look at various systems quickly and help you understand what those systems, how they're going to impact the project uh, from a cost schedule. And, and with the subs help, um, long-term long -term operations side of things as well. The bid process. So we are still, as a CM, um, we're, we're talking about 10, 12, 15% of the overall project. The rest of it is still competitively bid out to the market. And we do that together. We'll, we'll come up with a list of subcontractors every trade, painters, drywallers, electricians, We'll come with a list to the committee and say, How, what do you feel about these, this list of subcontractors? And you might see one and say, we never want to see that subcontractor in the district again. You might see that, that there's a painter that's missing that you'd like to make sure gets the opportunity to bid. We reconcile that list before we hit the market so that we're, we're all together on who's bidding on the project. And then we go through a process um, with, with Banwell's help in terms of getting questions answered. Um, making sure that the scope of work that the subcontractors are bidding is what we're, our expectations are. Then we'll come to the committee with a, with a spreadsheet with all the subs and their numbers uh, on the spreadsheet. We'll make a recommendation, but you have the final say on who gets, gets selected for, the, for the sub, whatever trade it might be. So it's an open process. It's a collaborative process. Um, and we've proven to, that it works. We also bring a, a, a really strong understanding of who that subcontractor market is uh, servicing Rochester. <coughs> I'm sure the, the market is a little bit of a concern for everyone. Um, 
there's been a lot of changes on supply, tra tra supply chain, uh, long lead, um, unemployment in New Hampshire still, still is very low, um, tax revenues is as high as they've ever been, and that money is being dispersed in, into projects across the state. <coughs> we, keep track of it. we keep track of the market as best we can. Um, we, we know what's driving the market, and this is really has to do with the subs and suppliers. Um, but we also come to, with solutions. We want to make sure that we're effectively hitting the market, finding the best subcontractors possible at the best price. Um, we maximize our position in, in New Hampshire as a company that's been around for 85 plus years, and we try to leverage that position. Um, we utilize subs as much as during the pre-construction process as much as we can, um, so that we have up-to-date um, current market information. We have no problem on the procurement side. Um, we can beat the procurement. We can find if equipment is a long lead item. We don't have a problem buying it and assigning it to a subcontractor later. Um, we will identify all those items that, that might be long lead items. Air handler units are, are one that are, are, are kind of the hot ticket right now because everyone needs them. Um, doors, windows, whatever it might be, we're in a position where we can help you procure that in a very strategic way so that we have the materials when we need them, um, not getting to a point in needing materials and not having them. <coughs> Again, I'm going to hand this to you afterwards, but it's a lot of things that we can do. Um, in terms of construction, when we get into construction, uh, we pride ourselves on really controlling sites, making them safe, organized, clean. Um, we, we give two-week look ahead so everyone knows what's coming up. Um, small, the, the, C, the CT expansion is a really good example of that. Um, Paul uh, kept this, this site extremely clean and organized. Um, you, school never Missed a beat, even though we were there building a, a pretty major addition to the school. And that's our commitment. One of, one of the many commitments we'll make to you is that we, we are going to be proactive in terms of managing the site. Um, we're going to keep it clean. We're going we're to have signage that makes sure that people know where they can go, when they can go, um, in terms of subcontractors and deliveries. Um, we'll, we'll delineate the construction site so, that, so it's, it's secure. Um, and, and we will have rules that we enforce uh, throughout the, that process of, of, uh, of constructing the new school. So I flew. <laughs> I did. I apologize for maybe going too fast, <laughs> faster than we ever rehearsed it. Um, we would welcome the opportunity to work with the district. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I think we're, we're really the most qualified and, and the best firm for partnering with uh, the, the district and to build the school. And hopefully we've demonstrated to you uh, in a very quick fashion, we could, you can always talk about it longer if you choose, um, but hopefully we demonstrated to you that we are prepared uh, and ready, willing, and able to, to move forward with you on this. So David, that brings us to the conclusion. Questions? questions. Well, I think David. Yeah, yeah. Sure. we'll yeah. entertain questions. Sure. Uh, have you done any work with Vanwell, or do you have a current open project? Or when was the last current project, or the last project you did with Vanwell? It's been a while, honestly, since we've worked with Vanwell. We did the Plymouth State um, Science, the Ban, the uh, I can't remember the, name. the Boyd Hall uh, expansion at Plymouth State, which is a great expansion renovation project with Vanwell. We've been searching for the opportunity for many, many years, um, as we think we're we're very compatible firms. And we would welcome that opportunity to, to work with Banwell, that's for sure. I would say that if you talk to architects, they'll tell you that we're team players, and I, there's absolutely no reason in the world why we can't collaborate and, and make this a very enjoyable experience for everyone. We don't want this to be a painful experience for anyone. We want this to be something that we're all proud of, something that at the end we look at and we say, hey, what, what a great team effort this was. And that, that all starts with the collaboration between the design Engineering, construction, and the committee. D does that? I wish I had 25 projects to tell you about. <laughs> Someday. Councilor Gordon. I got two questions if I may. Yeah. I'll, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm a little concerned about the subs issue because, as you know, it's a problem. <coughs> uh, how do you feel about that? Being able to get enough bids to come back to us with something 
that we can really look at, spend some time looking at. I'm not concerned at all. We have how many pre-qualified subs? Our database holds currently well over 2,000 suppliers, vendors, and subcontractors in our database, and we're adding to it every day, uh, literally every day. I just got a request this morning, as a matter of fact, to add another one. Um, so I, 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 would, I would mirror that sentiment that um, the horsepower and the, uh, the, the database that we have and the partnerships that we have with a lot of our trade partners is, is deep. And, and if we don't find the re reaction we won't get immediately, we'll continue that process to make sure that we are covered, and make sure that we are coming to the table with enough to make a good decision on it. That's not sure. Final question. Uh, the other thing is uh, as-built job documentation. Can we count on really good as-builts? <coughs> Yeah. Kathy. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Um, certainly, our mechanical and electrical trades will document their as builts. Um, we also, through our software tool Procore, do electronic posting or updating of drawings whenever um, re requests for information get answered, things get posted to the documents. Paul makes notes on the drawings. We can scan those in and have those printed and delivered as well. So nowadays, you can put a lot of information on a flash drive. And uh, more is more is better. So we end up giving a lot of all of our documentation. Really, it's uh, much easier to do now than it used to be. But yes, we, we certainly will provide that. Red line. I think it's also important um, to mention that we we are we are um, we still like to build, and the subcontractors know that. And when we call an electrician up and say we need 20 electricians here tomorrow, they show up and we're ready for them. We're not turning them away. They know that they can come in. They can do their work, they can make their fee, um, and, and move on. They're not being held up or delayed by us, and we also pay them on time, which motivates them uh, to, to, to be back the next day. So I would say those relationships and the leverage that we bring to the district in the market are stronger than anyone else out there, quite honestly. And that, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to, to throw it out there like that, but that's one of the things I'm extremely proud of is the relationships we have with the subs and how that reflects on our, our, on our, our clients uh, in a very positive way. That's very important. Thank you. Uh, school board member, Malia. So I know in the planning process, the goal is to have no, any, nothing is admitted. But if there's an admission, how do you handle that? Say omission? Is that omission. Yeah. omission. Mm -hmm. Listen. You forgot something in the planning process, you come down and sit in front of us, how do you handle that with us? That's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, like you said, inevitably there will be something missed, right? So there's an opportunity when we're putting it together, we're going to establish some contingencies within our estimates that will, to the best of our ability at that time, with the documents that we have, because we're going to go through a series of document estimating, will protect all of us to make sure that we have monies in the final GMP to be able to fill in those gaps that, oops, we missed. We do the best we can. Uh, there, we're human. Errors are made. But we strategically place uh, opportunities for funds to be there so that we can agree to it. And we agree to what that value is uh, going into the GMP. Thank you. Chair Lynch. Uh, the, the presentation was very well paced. The one thing I didn't notice on there was costs. Everyone else has shared their costs, projected like the general construction cost and that stuff. I didn't see any of that in your presentation, and I don't have a handout, so I wasn't sure if you had that information for us to review. We do. Okay. Uh, I put it in. I, I wasn't. No, I put it in an envelope. As long as we yeah. have it, it's yeah. fine. I just want to it's better than what it was. I'll tell you. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Um, I apologize. I thought I, I thought it was coming in low for you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. I just want to make sure we have that. You do have yeah. Okay. David, two extra for the folks in audience. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In terms of omissions, too, if I can just go back to your question, I think it is important. Hopefully, it is important for you to understand that we that we have a whole group of people that only focus on pre-construction. They're not managing projects and putting estimates together. They're not managing projects and, and putting schedules together. We have a group of, of pre-construction experts 
who are focused on making sure that when we, when we break ground, we've tried to eliminate all emissions as much as we possibly can. We do engage our project management team and our, our field team through that pre-construction process so that there's more eye, even more eyes looking at it. Um, but they're very focused and committed to doing their job on that pre-construction phase and really to minimize anything that, that might be missing. That goes back to the heebie-jeebies and all the questions that are, that are asked. But it works out at the end of the day. Uh, just one more question, and I, I know the answer to this, but I want to make sure some of the new JVC members hear it. Um, what's your experience with state-funded projects? With state-funded uh, Extensive. Um, we do, we, especially on the, on the K-12 market. Um, it's, it's something that, that market has been um, something that we've been focused, a market we've been focused on for 50 years. Um, with that, we've come to understand how, how to help support our clients through that process of, of selling the funding, quite honestly, to the state and make sure that you're maximizing, whether it be state or ESSER funding, whatever it might be. Um, we, we have experience on the accounting side, uh, on the project management side, and on the, on the estimating side that always helps and supports our clients in that process. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go Celtics. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully by the time you get home, they're up by 25 and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. questions that we want to address with each other and then and then make a decision. I agree. I, I, when we get the other item, a motion I'd like to make there too. I think that there should be some dialogue tonight because I think there's different perspectives from everybody that we need to kind of just chew the fat plus minuses. And then at the next meeting let's make a selection. But it gives us time to really because I got some stuff up that I've got to ask. But yeah, but I agree with that. Yeah, I think it's just time to digest it. Right. This is an important thing. Right. A lot of money involved yep. and yep. the project that we're endeavoring on. It's really important that this construction manager does the job properly. Right. That's right. 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 Yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds good, especially we have two members that weren't able to be right. here. Tonight. And then let them to be able to talk to anybody they need to or whatever, but I think mm -hmm. patience is important. So we'll wait for Mr. Todd and we'll start just hammering out the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Or you want to make a motion so and not have to get it. I mean, he's going to give you the documents, but if you make the motion, you can proceed with the meeting. And then what to suspend selection? Suspend selection, and then you have other, and then you have public comment. Okay, I'm sure. Because we can always go back and talk about it. We're not just, so you want to move back? So. Yeah. Um, school board member Pappas? Um, move the agenda around? To, no, to, no, to, to okay. make so a motion. And will we uh, postpone the selection of the construction manager to our next meeting? Is there a second? Second. All those uh, discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, so the next item on our agenda is item five, other. Does anyone have anything for other? Uh, we kind of have to wait for Mr. Toddy, but I want to hear his opinion on a clerk of the works or project manager from our side. We've had um, situations in previous buildings where it was extremely beneficial to have someone on our half. And I think um, 
when Dick Draco did it for us in East Rochester, there was a lot of really big benefits to having someone who represented us at those meetings and who could back up the superintendent. And there was some real value in that. So I'd like to. Well, the school department has a policy um, for that. So if this committee wants to task us with going out to put out a request for proposals for Clark of the Works, we can do that and hopefully come back with some folks, maybe not by next meeting, but maybe the one after that, right. that you would do something similar. Maybe we would meet with them first and then present you two finalists that you could interview and then select a clerk of the works. Do you have any preference in that? Do you think it's something we should be reviewing? Is it, what is your opinion on this? Well, our policy says that we do have one and in our past bills we have. So, I mean, you could leave it to Dave and I to select one if you want, or you can, Ask us to bring you the two finalists. I think it's fine, Dave. Those yeah. guys. So, I, I'll make a motion to ask the superintendent and director of facilities to put out an RFP for clerk of the works and let us know who they get. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Yeah. yeah. So when you say let us know who they get, do you mean bring the two finalists to us, or they make a decision? And I would be fine with them making the decision. Um, the reality is that. From all the construction we've done in the last 10 years between East Rochester and uh, the, the Tech Center, he's really there just, we facilitate through them, they facilitate through him, and then they bring it back to us. Mm -hmm. When we needed Mr. Drapo, specifically at East Rochester for certain things, he came in, presented as like, hey, here's what I did. You gave us these targets, there's what it was. He's still part of the project, but the day-to-day -day stuff is through those guys. Is that, are you not comfortable with that? No, no I am, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, no, I, I, I worded it poorly. Okay, so I understand. All right. Mr. Todd, if I can ask you a question while you're walking around. Sir, you would be in favor of a clerk in the works? <clears throat> it's uh, school board policy. Yeah, we got from Mr. And we need a uh, will hire a clerk in the works. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. <laughs> All right. All right, there being a motion and a second, all in favor. We need to talk about money first, though. How much extra are they going to cost? Traditionally, they, I don't even know how many. We'll vote on something. I want to know what the, how much it's going to, financially going to cost us. All right. Well, I think yeah. the bigger question is how much it will save us. Yeah, and warranty stuff. So I, I, that's a very fair question. So maybe we do ask the superintendent to present us with what his recommendation is before we vote on the hiring the clerk of the works. We understand what the cost is. I think that's yeah. acceptable. Kyle, is that manageable? We can nominate, and then you guys will hear about the nomination and the, the parameters, and then you'll approve that. Okay. Is that fair, Paul? Yeah. Yep. I think it's a smart idea. to do to your motion, or is that just clarifying? I just clarified. So just to respond to Mrs. Grassi, I, I understand that you know it's a savings having one, but I, I just think it's important to know how much we're looking for for finances. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Anything else under other? Yeah, yeah, I have a question about the uh, the RFP process, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on what we received back. These numbers we have, and I see on the on the website the summary table of the numbers, and then we've got the updated numbers tonight. But the uh, RFP lists a bunch of uh, sorry, several selection criteria. Were th were there anything in the responses that specifically provided a written response to those selection criteria? Um, and do we have we gone through a process to actually evaluate them against those selected criteria? Yes, we interviewed all of all six of the respondents, okay. came and sat down through an interview process with the business administrator, the superintendent, and myself. Okay. And we evaluated, narrowed it down to three candidates that brought were brought forward tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for the three that were that didn't make the cut, what were the general reasons if? if you can, for why they didn't make the cut? It, well, it, it was a, an extremely difficult decision because I think we had six great respondents. Right? There's, I, I don't think there's anybody other six respondents that couldn't deliver an excellent project in, in the long run. Um, we, we, we broke it down by, by looking at who we thought could best deliver the, the, the project to the city of Rochester. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anything else under other? 
Yeah. We're going to need to pick a date of our next meeting. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, and I don't we probably don't want to go much beyond two weeks, I think, if possible. Thank two weeks, we have a five year committee on Monday. Yeah, I think for this committee, I think the consensus was Wednesdays work the best because Mondays there's planning board. Yeah, Thursdays is school board, board and right. committees. Tuesday, city council. Tuesday, city council. So I think Wednesdays. Can we do the 17th? That's two weeks. There's a public safety committee that All night. Right. <laughs> 24th looks good. 24th looks good? At least on the school side, I yeah. speak for the counselors. 25th is open too. Uh, not for me. Not for me. Yeah, we'll try to stay with the first one. So that's the fourth one. Yep. Oh, right. There's another There's commitment that day. That unfortunately, it could be a conflict. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. So 25th is out. 24th would work for me. What about you guys? I think that works wrong. Does that work, Steve? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Paul, is that okay for you? May 24th? Yes, sir. Yeah. Get it ready. 6 p.m. 6, 6 p.m.? Yeah. Six yeah. We'll do it here. Is that cool with you guys? Sure. That's good. Sure. Alex, you okay with that? I agree. Yes. Cool. Yeah. All right. <coughs> we'll communicate that to Don and yeah, we're gonna All right. so 24th. Wednesday, May 24th, 6 p.m. Yeah. 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 Mr. Pappas. Do we want to offer any observations at this point, or do we want to save that for three weeks from now? Because it's fresh in everyone's mind. And we can have a conversation, of course. Fine. I think it's worth discussing yeah. our first oh, response fresh. or mm -hmm. reaction to this. Yeah. You want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, when you look at just the raw map, uh, DEW's about 100 grand more than Harvey. Um, and I think those two are about the same size. I think Matt's question about omissions was fantastic. <laughs> Um, right, it seems to be something we tripped over in the last project. I think there was a lot of unbeknownst to that. Um, I really thought DEW, one of the big draws, in my opinion, of DEW was that they have in-house services that supplement subs, which is a, a subs late, and I get it. They all say they're gonna, if they're going to be on time, they're going to be clean. You can't manage people that effectively. DEW having in-house services to supplement is a big draw to me. That's a big draw. But the timeline and the specificity of how we spend the state money, we need guys who can get guys on the ground. And DEW has guys in-house if they can't get us up. That's a big, big plus to me. Um, I think the coverages were comparable in regards to insurance, bonding, and safeties. I think they all have their own stories to tell. I thought Bowen, is that Bowen? Yes. Ba Bowen did a very nice job. I think that the one thing that sticks out to me is they have 19 renovations in, in three new schools. We're talking about building a brand new school. We need someone who has a lot of experience with brand new schools. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying they're not capable. Oyster River came out gorgeous, but Oyster River is not Rochester. Right? So I, I have some concerns there. Um, understanding the management of state funding is a big plus. Harvey's done it for us already in the tech center. We've seen firsthand how they know how to negotiate with DOE. They're a great support to the superintendent, Dave Dottie. So there's some values there for me. I think if I were to prioritize it, one, two, and three, it'd be DEW one for me, Harvey two, and Bowen three. Just personal reflection. Yeah, school board member Blair. Um, so, I, and I see the point that uh, Mr. Lynch just brought up about there's a hundred thousand dollars more for DEW and the operating cost, or the, the solid cost. The, the point that I look at is the change orders in the construction phase services of 2.1% with DEW versus 2.5. We've seen change orders. That 0.4% will add up and eat up that difference very quickly. So I think, to me, the, the apples to apples are those two. Um, and that's where, what are, who's bringing more to the, uh, the plate? Unfortunately, I, I think uh, Bowen fell short in a lot of areas for me. Um, and seeing some of their previous work and commercial application, I, I think that we have a, a two better options. Um, the only thing I'll add, um with the DEW, I like that they have a uh, already established relationship with Banwell. I think that that helps a lot <coughs> with uh, partnerships and moving forward and being efficient. 
that was one draw I had to DEW. I thought they placed a lot of emphasis on efficiency um, yep. and shortening the timeline. Yeah. I was impressed with their uh, documentation of the project as it progresses. I think that's important. Um, later on, like they said, you want to knock a hole in the wall to put a new door in. You don't want to find out there's a water pipe in there. Yeah. So, you know, this kind of thing is important for us going forward. And I also think they have the expertise in their relationship with the architect. And as you said, having your own on staff people to fill in the boards. When, when a contractor just simply doesn't show up, that keeps us on schedule. $100,000, big deal. It's pocket change in the whole scheme of this. The only other thing that I really liked um, was when I asked the question about the clerk of the works, he was engaged and happy and liked the idea. Um, not all, uh, specifically when we did East Rochester, there was some confrontation there. Well, he can't, you know, that's his job. He represents us. So I think that there's value in that. and They seem to embrace that idea. It just shows more collaboration, in my perspective. Yeah. I really think that's a good thing. And in regard to what you were just commenting on, the, the, the OEM and o and is important. The fact that these guys have a digital solution, now, again, I'm not comfortable until we know what it's going to cost. If they go with one company and you got to pay a subscription, I don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. But if they can figure out how to hand us a template where it's digital, mm -hmm. where, you know, 20 years from now, with Dave Toddy still shoveling snow and yelling about terrible equipment <laughs> and needing boom lifts, we're going to be able to open this digital thing and read where everything is. I think that's just the way technology is going to go. So I think it's really smart that they have a solution. Now, are we willing to pay for it? I don't know. But the fact that they can do it, I think, is something that shows innovation. I, I like that. Yeah. So he did mention one solution that had no fee. Right. So that's another good reason to be waiting on this, to find out if we can get that information. Yeah. They're going to incorporate that solution, because we don't know. A licensing fee for software could be forty dollars or $50,000 a year. A hundred percent agree. Yes. Yeah. So I think so. it's important. If we can, uh, Mr. Todd, if you could follow up with that, uh, uh, with DEW, and find out what those incremental costs would be for those O&M softwares, that would be greatly appreciated before the next meeting, if you could, sir. Yes, sir. Any other comments? Yeah. Uh, a question. Did we contact any of the references that any of these? Yes. Providers. Part of the selection process. So okay. We, we talked to all of them. Okay. So that was already factored into yeah. their their making the final cut. Okay. Yeah. I have a question, and I'm not sure if it's inappropriate or not. So I'm going to look at Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I, I ask in, Can I ask Ingrid a question or no? Sure. She's great. She works for us. Ingrid, um, you you have experience with DEW. If you had any delays, concerns, or issues with these guys, or no. was there anything that you they seem you guys have seemed to hit on a couple projects, yeah. and you're comfortable with them? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Not really much of a critical note, but um, <clears throat> all things being equal, I, I, I see these two firms being very similar in scope and size and abilities and and the have you. Um, we do have a lot of experience, well, some experience here with um, Harvey, and they did produce a good product for us uh, with the tech center, so I don't want to discount that. Um, and DEW hasn't really penetrated into the seacoast all that much, so um, there's really, I mean, unless you really want to travel far and look at, at their products um, elsewhere in the state, he said Wyndham is the closest to us, that's still an hour away um, and whatnot. But, um, I'm comfortable with either one, but I, I think the edge goes to Harvey um, for me. I just, um, if I may, I would just add too that uh, since the city has a relationship with Harvey, that uh, uh, I think that's important. Uh, I agree that DEW has the um, ability that you subcontractors, if something falls through, but uh, Harvey, Harvey's been around at least 80 years, it sounds like. They had a database of over 2,000 folks. They were very confident that they would be able to get their laborers here. And I think they did a fantastic job at the vocational center. They're familiar with the area, familiar with our district. So I, personally, I was kind of leaning towards them. The other big thing that I appreciated about DEW and, um, and uh, 
Parvi was that they understand that supply chain is a problem. Uh, understanding that supply chain is a problem, they're buoyant enough to be able to right. buy and hold and then release ownership to the subs as needed so to help prevent that management. That's a huge thing. I mean, anybody trying to buy an electrical panel right now has the exact problem, right? So here's some of the things that I think those guys have that, that unfortunately one doesn't. Is a quick follow I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I'm certainly interested in what the experts have to say on who we should go with, because I'm not an expert. I agree. I don't know how, uh, I, don't know, I think we should put them on a the spot, what they think. <laughs> they I love right. That'd be you, Mr. Toddy. He's turning red. <laughs> <laughs> but we were, it's, I'm going to say exactly the same thing you guys said. D, 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 and they, they put on a great show. Boy, they look fantastic, right? And some of the slick software stuff, looking through walls later, they have a deep and long history with, with Bentonville Architects. Um, that's all stellar. Harvey is a known quantity. I've personally worked with Kathy and Paul and Rob. I know them all very well. I know what they can and can't do. And I know if they stand here and tell us they can deliver a project, they can deliver a project. Uh, uh, Bowen Construction, I've never worked with them, but they did do, they delivered a beautiful school at, at Oyster River through the worst of COVID. So there, there's really no contractor that came before you tonight that can't deliver a project. Um, I, I see, like, like you do, like a lot of you have said, I think Harvey and DEW, DEW are, are very similar. I think they both have the horsepower to get it done. So the question is, do you want to try something new, somebody that might give a different look to something that, that we haven't seen before, or do we want to go with the tried and true? That's that's the question for you guys to answer. There's my political answer. Good. <laughs> Heck of a sidestep. Heck of a sidestep. That was good to talk. You're not for office. Yeah. You want to hear from Yes, yeah, she's ready to speak. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I came into this not really knowing, you know, who I would be leaning towards, and it's Harvey and DEW are two different, you know, uh, companies. Bowen is a good company, it's just a different scale. Um, we can work with both. Um, we do have a very good relationship with DEW, but Harvey, we've done stuff in the past with, and we can work with them as well. The money, it, like everyone said, it's going to even out in the end. To me, it's about the personalities of the two groups and who we're going to be working with and who you are drawn towards. Technologically, I do think DEW has a little bit of a, a leg up with the you know technological things. But I think if we wanted that program, we could ask Harvey to do it as well. So to me, it's really about the people. <laughs> well, I, as we, we said in our pre-selection um, process, we called all the references. So I, I spoke to a number of superintendents, and, and the flavor we gave you tonight were two big and one small. And we had a couple of, of bigs and a couple of smalls in the in the six that we interviewed. Um, as everyone said, I think everyone that we showed you here tonight is someone that could do the job. I think uh, I agree with what Ingrid said. It's about who you feel personally connected to because you're going to be in a relationship with them for a long time. And if anyone's ever built a house, you know things don't go smoothly, and, and you want to get along with the people that you got to work things through. Um, I will just say, for you know, out of respect to the, the Bowen Corporation that came forward tonight, um, the superintendents that worked with them had nothing but glowing things to say in a very familiar family style. As you see a much smaller organization, um, but uh, one superintendent, actually the most recent one, was superintendent in, in um, Worcester River, has done many building projects in Maine and in New Hampshire. Um, no change orders. Um, I asked another superintendent uh, that, that where they worked, no change orders. So again, you can't guarantee that on our project, but again, being small, that might be to their benefit with, again, how they customize the feel and, and the flow of the project. Um, but again, we wouldn't know that until we enter into that relationship if we chose to do so. I'll add that um, I actually met with the superintendent at Oster. Some of you know that I work there. and. Uh, it was, uh, I met with them on a separate issue, and the very first thing he wanted to talk about was their elementary school project, and he highly recommended Bowen. Um, so I was looking forward to their presentation. I think it was a little less than, than what we expected, but 
Um, he said many of the same things that, that uh, Kyle said, that no change orders, very, very easy to work with, um, and highly recommended. He could not recommend them more um, than any other company that, they, that he's ever worked with. Well, I think so the other thing to take into consideration is we're not paying these people to be presenters. Right? We're paying them to build a building. So again, you know, you could pay for a dog and pony show and not get a great building. So I think that's something to be cognizant of. Yeah, uh, I, I think that, well, uh, to Kyle's point, the, uh, the first note I wrote under Bowen was smaller team, family run, overall less polished. But to, to your point, we're not paying them to be good presenters, right? I think that, um, so I don't know yet if I would, who I would choose, but I'd say Bowen, I think deserves a, a good shot in the running. I think that what they did in Oyster River is, is amazing. Um, if I was, so for me, it's between probably Bowen or Harvey because I think DEW, if they're comparable to Harvey, but they're farther away, they have no real close by experience. Um, Harvey's a known quantity, but I think Bowen, you know, and, and if, if we can hope there are no change orders, then that 0.4% doesn't really come into play. But, but to your point, if it, if it does come into play, that eats up that, that difference pretty quick. Um, but I think we should, should certainly consider them because I, they do seem to have a lot of roots all around us. And I think I, I'd also be in favor of, you know, maybe, maybe I like the underdog a little bit. Yeah. I, I agree with you, and I don't mean to be dismissive when I said I've ranked them one, two, three, and I tried to give the pluses and minuses, but I wrote my same notes, you know, less roosters in the hen house is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the fact that they're small and they're, they're managed appropriately. If you look at a lot of their projects, they're SP2s, right? Like, there was no state funding for the Oyster River project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the same thing. That's the part that concerns me. Mm -hmm. It's not about the deliverable, because if you drive by that school, I want to go in and check it out. It, that thing's stunning. So it's not about the deliverable, but it's one of those things we're trying to manage. Kyle? I, I think it's important to point out, I mean, I think it's a good question to ask. The construction manager has next to nothing to do with the state funding. We, as the entity that works with the state, they're our Department of Education. Our business department works with the Department of Education, not the construction manager. So, so it's, a, it's a valid question to say, have you worked on state projects? But they have nothing to do with the funding relationship that exists between the DOE and us as a local education agency. So it, it's kind of a moot point. Okay. So I point out that a small company like that, there's a lot more at stake for them on a project like this than there is a larger company because they only do a few small few projects like this. Right, so if this project doesn't come out well, it really reflects poorly on them in the whole scheme of things. Whereas a big company like these other two, you know, they do a dozen projects like this at a time. They probably have a dozen projects going. So I think that you're gonna, we're gonna get more attention from this company because we're probably the only project they're working on, or maybe one of two projects that they're working on. So I, I think that there's something to consider there in the whole scheme of things as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. The teacher and me loved the fact that they interacted with the staff and the faculty and the children the way they did. I mean, that, that, I'm not an expert on building. That's not my field. So I was kind of putting that as a negative in the back of my mind and not a reason to choose them because they, they but, but knowing the workforce the way it is right now, it's in their best interest to entice people to want to join their workforce. And you start very early to get children interested in that kind of a, a, a career. And they, they got to see it and touch it and walk into it and buy it all the time. I bet you'll see builders come out of that school. You know, so I, at the least, I think it's um, worth considering a company that's got, you know, that wants to take the next big step. This is a big project. I'll add that a few of my students actually worked on that. <coughs> they mentioned that if they hired a few seniors. Right. Some of my students were actually hired by them, and, and I now that I, you made me think of that, that yeah, they, they said they had a very good experience, and they've gone into the trades after that. So 
um, although it's this this project's not next to a, a no, it would be much school, harder to take field trips to this to this <laughs> location. Right. But I'm sure that anybody that had an interest, they would um, right. make it work. Yeah. <coughs> now that we've decided, all three are wonderful. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy our next week. You made the soup a little weaker. Yeah. All right. Those were some really good points and feedback and things for us to consider and think about between now and our next meeting. Is there anything else under other? All right, there being none, I would like to open up public comment and just for the public, it is public comment where you talk but we can't go back and forth. So you'll have five minutes if you could just state your name and address and we welcome you here tonight and we thank you for your patience and waiting. Good evening, it is late. Um, I like a hot mess, sorry. I have my nieces this week and I came straight here from the house. Um, you all going to be shocked at me saying this, especially the school board, city council really don't know me. Um, I am going to agree with Paul Lynch tonight. I, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Pappas. Thank you. Um, I liked one in three. Um, hearing everything, number one is actually in my top list. Um, they do have the contractors already available. Um, just because they're like maybe an hour away, I mean really see an issue if they're doing all these projects all over New Hampshire, even in Vermont. Um, I think it's, I personally think number one is, is really good. Um, number three, the only issue is, is I agree with Ms. Grassi that um, the economy this world, a lot of people don't want to work. So if you're going to be going to the bid for number two and three, are we going to have the electricians? Are we going to have the flooring? Are we going to have the, you know, ceiling people or lighting or anything like that? Are we really going to have those people that are going to be doing bidding? And my husband is an electrician. He does all the electrical work for the submarines. Um, so... I know that those are expensive, so if they're going to go to bidding, are those electric companies going to bid higher? And with the district working with, there is an electric company that you guys really like, just if they bid higher, are you going to go with them because they bid higher because they've done work? Or are you going to give someone another chance that's bid lower? I mean, this is a lot of money for the school. Um, another thing that concerns me is the location. Um, my best friend, literally, school, the new school will be here. Her house is like literally over here, right around the corner. I'm there every single day. The traffic is horrendous. It's literally the whole road is swamp. If it rains just a little bit, it's a swamp. Uh, so with city council members here, um, maybe you guys can consider this and talk about the next meeting is, you guys have a lot of property. Is this really the best location for this new school? Once they start digging, is there going to be an issue with water? It's the only issue with this. And how are, where the location is, it's a curve. How are the buses and students, parents, whatever, going into these schools? I did watch the city council um, last week when I was in California, and I'm not sure which council member it was, I'm sorry, um, the saying about um, are they going to have to do a roundabout, is that in the budget? Are they going to do sidewalks, is that in the budget? I mean, all these favors are in the budget. Well, not those ones are not in the budget. So do we have to consider doing a roundabout? Do we have to consider doing sidewalks? I mean, these are all questions that you know, needs to be answered, and I'm hoping next week you guys can answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who's the public wishing to address the committee? Good evening. Uh, Ray Wayman, 55 Ida Circle. 
Um, Ida Circle is a new subdivision right next to the property that's proposed for a new school. This is the worst idea I have ever heard of for any government agency, and I've worked for the government for 35 years. I've seen a lot of bad ideas. Sure, let's build a new school. We need a new school. The old school downtown is falling in. It's 100 years old. Let's do it. The city of Rochester owns a lot of property in the area. I don't know why one of those properties that's already owned couldn't be used and it's a $250,000 savings for the taxpayers because we're the ones that are paying the bill. Um, I had a whole speech here, a whole thing here for tonight, but I think it's better aimed at the city council rather than at the joint uh, building committee. Uh, but I will say that uh, Councillor Bowden uh, brought up some very good points at the city council meeting uh, authorizing the purchase of this property. And I echo those same uh, um, sentiments as he has. It's in a horrible location. Uh, most of the land is a swamp, so you have 12 acres out of 40 that you can actually use. Uh, there's limited access. And the biggest concern I have is we're in a new subdivision, and there just so happens to be a potential access road through our subdivision. We don't want that traffic through our subdivision. So hopefully the access will only be off of Salmon Falls Road, where um, hopefully that no children get killed by some accident because somebody's speeding down Salmon Falls Road. Um, so that's pretty much what I had to say about that. I shortened that right up. I'll leave that for the city council. But as far as the contractors, the construction managers, I will say that Listen, if you want your dad doing the construction, and you want some guy you can talk to and say, hey, let's get this done. Uh, hey, we need to change this today. We need to get this done tomorrow. Then uh, Bowden is your people's. You know, they, they can talk to you. They don't have a lot of, seems like a lot of whiz-bang reports and nice charts and graphs. And, you know, we have this cool stuff and that cool stuff. You just say, hey, Mr. Bowden, uh, Let's put some tile floor in that gym, and you'll be like, okay, what kind of tile floor do you want? We'll get that done tomorrow. But if you want a company that's professional and a known quantity, uh, apparently, I'm new to this area, so I, I don't know who is who. Uh, I guess that's a disadvantage or an advantage. Um, if you want a company that can probably get the job done and give you a lot of reports and make sure that the contractors, they have the right contractors and they can purchase materials and get um, the project done on time, I think, um, I know you're hanging on every word, uh, I think Harvey is your company because they uh, seem to have done some work here, they're a known commodity, they're kind of local I guess, yes, um, so let's keep the money local if we can, they know the local contractors and um, they have a lot of whiz bang reports. And, at the end of the presentation, I think they did say they had some program about the building, so if you're plumbing in the wall, you know it. Whether it's a subscription or added cost. Um, but just put the added cost on taxpayers, you know? I'll, I'll give a little more money out of my wallet, raise the taxes while we're raising the rest of the money for the school. We'll get the money from somewhere, as Mr. Mayor says. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to address the committee? Hi, I'm uh, Mark Perry, uh, 759 Simmon Falls Road. Um, I got to at least put my comment in about the location. Um, I'm very familiar with the property and I bought it on the major part of the side of my property. Um, that property went up for sale. Um, in December of 18 for $400,000. Do you know why no one bid on it? No one tried to offer anything for it? Because it's worthless. Um, the access to that property, there's two accesses to Sigmund Falls Road. One is a 57 foot right of, uh, road frontage that abuts next to me, which um, I don't believe is enough to be able to put in a true roadway to the school. The other thing is a 50 foot right of way that runs through what a property that actually runs through a resident's barn. Um, to use that right of way, you'd have to demolish their barn. Makes good neighbors. Um, 
the site plan that I happened to catch a glimpse of when SUI came to do the test pits, I saw that it's going to loop through the development um, with a potential exit road of some sort of entrance road off of Salmon Falls. But it looked like the majority road was going to go through um, the development, which I believe will cause major traffic problems. Mm -hmm. You're going to congest this poor development. Um, Salmon Falls Road is Bristol Motor Speedway. It is a demo derby. We have accidents on a regular basis. It's a fast road. No matter how many speed limit blinking signs you put on there, it's a fast road. Um, so I think that the traffic consideration, and then some, you know, brought up sidewalks. Um, you know, you can't expect kids to be walking to school that much, maybe out of that one development. But could you better place the school closer to central town? You're using less busing. You have more kids that are able to actually walk to school, saving us money on busing, getting to um, a pretty rural area of Rochester. Um, and it's wet. You know, I've got water running off of that property on the mine. It is above mine elevation-wise. Um, yeah, we've had some unprecedented rain lately, but even still in a normal year, in the years that I've been there, every spring it's a torrential flood of water that comes down off of that property. It's really wet. Um, I know that in the late 80s, um, the Army Corps of Engineers did a survey on the property adjacent to mine, that is 767 Salmon Falls Road, formerly 363 before reverse 911. Um, that's a 28-acre parcel there, and they were attempting to develop or build something out back, and the Army Corps of Engineers stated that it was not buildable. Um, since the late 80s, I don't think the property's gotten any drier. So the adjacent property being right there, um, I've got to say that there's still going to be some really big wetlands concerns, or you know we can you can run ditches and drain it, but okay, you drain it off of that property, it's got to go somewhere. Whether you put it across Salmon Falls Road and dump it in the Terra Estates and flood those people out of their homes, mm -hmm. the ditch is already overrun on Salmon Falls Road when we get torrential rains. I don't know if it's a public works issue, whether we're not maintaining the ditches well enough or what, but that has been something that I have seen um, a lot of recently. Um, as for the actual contractors, um, I've worked for a variety of different companies. I've worked for the small mom and pops, I've worked for the large companies. Uh, contractor number two has like my backing behind them because it's that family type atmosphere, it's a small group. Um, I think that they would be able to meet your needs and service the community in a very positive way. Could the other two do it? Absolutely. But will they do it with the family atmosphere? Who knows? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hi. My name is Darlene Morris, or D. Morris, as most of my friends know me. I live in the new development, Meadowcourt, that we all spent an outrageous amount of money during COVID to move into a rural area where we could have a quiet, small subdivision without traffic. But we have Samuel Ball Road, and we all knew that when we moved there. What we didn't realize is after we moved there, that Terra Estates would change their tra traffic pattern going in and out of Terra Estates and make it to where when you pull out on from Ida Circle onto Salmon Falls Road that you're taking your life in your hands almost every single day. And so the older folks at Terra Estates, they moved there as a 55 plus community because they wanted no children. And, you know, I don't think anybody's even talked to them about how they feel about this, let alone the fact that now we're all going to live after we've just got dumped two years of construction and dirt and dust and noise in our own development, that now you're asking us all to go back to 16 months, probably, of dirt and dust and noise at 6 a.m., possibly seven days a week, as they said. So there's that. So it's a rural area. It was not designed for a school system. It's farmland. It's countryside. It's where we all chose to move so that we weren't in downtown Rochester and now you want to bring it to us. 
we're all thrilled to death, as you can tell. But the bigger problem is, is for me, I have real construction concerns. One of those being, you're going to have huge parking lots. Where are you going to maintain your water? Where is it going to, where is all the runoff going? There are people with wells right next to you. So when you have the run water runoff from all the parking lots and all the buses in and out, are you going to have pits to hold? You know, are you going to have your own retention ponds? And how is that going to affect the environmental part as far as the wetlands in that area? So have you done an environmental impact study? Have you done a noise study? Have you done a traffic study? Have you looked at how you're going to impact the neighborhood around you? How are you going to contain the noise after the school is built for the neighborhood that did not buy into living next to a school? I've heard from a lot of people that you own a lot of other property in Rochester. And so are you going to put sidewalks through our neighborhood? Are we going to have no parking signs so that we don't have parent pickups trotting through our neighborhood? Are you going to have sidewalks down Salmon Falls Road? Are you going to change the, to where you put in traffic lights? Are you going to change the speed? Are, how are you going to enforce the speed limit change? Are you going to put a traffic light down at Whitehall Road to stop the traffic down here and then try to prevent it from coming all the way up to that curve? It's all a big disaster. It's a horrible location. I'm not saying that because I don't want it in my backyard. I'm saying it because it's just not the ideal location. If you listen to some of what he said tonight, he talked about peers. When you put in peers, that means that you have substantial concerns about the property being able to have good footing because you don't have good soil, because you have a water table in that area. And I know for a fact because in my drainage ditch in front of my house is a constant running stream that's never going away because they had groundwater. When I went to the town and said to them, what are you going to do? Well, there's nothing we can do. It's groundwater. We have groundwater at four feet. That means you don't have stable construction four feet down. So when you have your architect drawing up your plans, have they made any of those concerns known? of what you're going to do. You're looking for a builder, somebody who's going to be your project manager. That's all these people are going to do is, is run your project. The real question is, is who's your architect? And have you done all these studies that I talked about? And is there a lot of cost savings by just moving location to somewhere that doesn't have all of these issues? Because as of right now, not a single issue that I stated is not a real concern. So when you go to the state and you say to the state, I want $30 million in funding, is it really going to be the state's going to only going to give you half of that? Then what do you do to get the rest of the money? You come back to the taxpayers, excuse my phone. No, it's it's fine. Just, is it? You can wrap it up, please. Yeah, we're coming back telling the taxpayers, you've got to come up with more money because we picked a horrible location. And now we need to find some way to get rid of the wetland. So that's my spiel. And I know it's not what anybody wanted to hear. But if I had to pick somebody, being in the business a long time, I'd go with Harvey. And only because you've worked with them. You know what you got. And if they don't like it, they're going to tell you they don't like it. Because they already have a relationship with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to address the committee? Okay. I'll close public comment. Item 7 is adjourned. Is there a second to adjourn? Non-debatable. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.